The new teachers a couple of weeks ago went through a pretty comprehensive uh, teacher induction program, which Chris Kelly and her pretty much her first major uh, project uh, led and uh, designed for for the new teachers. It consisted of three days of district-wide activities and one day with with the schools. And there's a copy of the agenda in your packet on those. Um, uh, activities that were occurring. So this evening what we would like to do is we would like to have each uh, principal or director come up and introduce the staff um, for their area. We're going to start first with the RISE Preschool. Um, Kelly Boswick is going to come up and introduce her new teacher. And if we could have, I probably should have said this, if we could have the, the new teachers on this side of the podium for the side. photographer. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right. So I'd like to introduce Erin um, Joyce. She has a bachelor's from uh, Westfield State and a master's from Salem. And she is our new substantially separate teacher in our Compass program at the preschool. We, she was originally at Birch Meadow as a paraeducator and then was a paraeducator at RISE. And then we snagged her up as a teacher. Okay, yay. Welcome. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I'd like to have now the principal at Coolidge Middle School come forward, Sarah Marchand, with her staff. Thank you so much, um, and thanks for having us here tonight. Um, we have six new teachers at Coolidge, three of whom are here tonight, and I'm excited to introduce you to them. First, we have Matthew Darling. He's our new Instructional Technology Integration Specialist, the longest job title of the evening. Um, Matt attended Fitchburg State for his undergraduate degree, where he majored in Communications Media. He obtained a master's in special education from Lesley University. Prior to arriving at, Cool at Coolidge, he has been teaching at parochial schools, t um, technology, social studies, and religion. And outside of school, he likes to teach karate and has for 20 years. So next is Kevin Gallagher, who is teaching seventh and eighth grade social studies on Team Gemini. Kevin is actually a RMHS graduate, so you might know him. Um, he attended Salem State, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in history, as well as two minors in secondary education and Spanish. After he completed his teaching practicum at Salem High, he actually came to Reading and spent almost all of last year as a substitute at Coolidge, where we grew to really appreciate his talents. And so now he is hired as a one-year position for our social studies department and is also working with our boys hockey team here at the high school. And third is Rosine Munson, called Ro. Eighth, she's in the sixth grade learning center. Roe earned her bachelor's degree from Salem State University, where she majored in elementary education and English. She earned her master's degree in moderate disabilities from Cambridge College. And prior to her arrival at Coolidge, she's actually been with our district for a while. She was a paraeducator last year at Parker and worked at Joshua Eaton prior to that um, as a special education substitute and has been a tutor in the district. And even prior to being in Reading, she was at Linfield where she worked as a METCO tutor. So we're thrilled to have her. And the three people missing tonight are Danielle Healy, who's our new wellness teacher, health and wellness, Don Davies, who is in our sixth grade therapeutic support program, and Shannon Turner, who's seventh grade ELA. So right. that's our Coolidge. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to now have uh, the principal of Parker Middle School please come forward with her staff, Ricky Shanklin. So I have um, three new teachers at my school. And um, the person who's not here tonight is Anne Ozani, and she's our new school psychologist. We have Hannah Mulkern who received a Bachelor of Arts in Latin American and Iberian Studies from UMass Boston and her Master's in Education from the American International College. She comes to us from Mystic Valley Regional Charter School and will be teaching Spanish in grades seven and eight. Hannah also has a love for drama, specifically choreography, 
and baking and winter camping and hiking. Uh, we have Chris McCabe. He received his Bachelor of Arts in English from LaSalle College and Master's degree from Simmons College. He comes to us from Lowell Public Schools where he taught sixth grade. His extracurricular interests include track and cross country and snowboarding. He will be teaching sixth grade English at Parker. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. I know that uh, our next principal has been at a meeting already this year, but I do would like I would like to introduce her again, uh, Kathleen Boynton, our high school principal. Uh, as as you know, Kathleen was the assistant principal at Bedford High School um, since 2012. She also was a teacher in Brookline High School and Brockton High School prior to that, um, where her area of focus was for social studies. So I'm going to have Kathleen and her staff now come up. Thank you, Dr. Darty. So we have several, uh, several. We have, I have three pages of, of hires. So several people are, were, were unable to make it today. Uh, Dan Amaral, who is not new to Reading, um, he was a paraeducator at Coolidge Middle School. He is a new teacher in the English department. Troy Carr is our new school psychologist. Melanie Destala is a new teacher in our math department. Stephanie Waite is a new teacher in our special education TSP program. Lauren Gablinski is our new guidance counselor. Grace Rousseau and Aisha Khan are two new chemistry teachers, and they were unable to join us today. I have to my right uh, Sarah McDonough, special education teacher. Sarah has a bachelor's degree in special education from Westfield State and a master's degree in special education from Fitchburg State. She previously worked in the Lynn Public Schools as a special education teacher. Next to her is Angela Bosco. Angelo is one of our new Spanish teachers. He has a bachelor's degree in English and Spanish from Webster University and a Master of Arts in Spanish from Middlebury College. He previous, previously taught Spanish at Lynn Classical High School and Malden Catholic High School. Next to Angelo is Saban Namvar. Namvar. He's our new social worker at RMHS. Saban has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from, where are we? from U Lowell, that's right, UMass Lowell, a master's degree in social work also uh, from Wheelock College, and he previously served as the director of community support services for the entire town of Andover, um, and worked as a social worker for the Lexington Public Schools. We hope he's going to also coach wrestling. Cool. Welcome. And next to him is Steve DiPietro. Um, he is joining, the RMH, uh, joining RMHS as a health, wellness, and PE teacher. He has a bachelor's degree in physical education from Salem State, a master's degree in physical education from Emporia State University. He previously worked for the Waltham and Lynn Public Schools, was a substitute teacher here in Reading, so not new to us, and will be supervising the weight room after school at RMHS. So a warm welcome to my new RMHS family. Excellent. The next uh, principal I'm gonna introduce actually doesn't have any other staff here to introduce, but I'm gonna introduce her anyway. She's a new principal. Um, who you met uh, earlier in the hiring process, uh, Beth Levitt. Beth is the principal at Barrows Elementary School. Um, Beth did her uh, principal internship in Andover last year. She was part of the DESE uh, PALS program, which is a very rigorous um, leadership licensure program now that the state has. And I'm sure Beth at some point can tell you all about that, because <laughs> um, I know it's a, it's a very challenging program, but Beth did a great job with it. Uh, Beth also has taught at the E. Ethel Little School. The one little commonality with that is I I was a student at the E at the Little School <laughs> many, many years ago. Beth was not there at the time. Um, so that's where she was a grade two teacher. So we want to welcome Beth to um, our, our team. So thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to have Killam Principal Sarah Levesque. Please come up. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us. This is always one of my favorite nights. We get to celebrate our new hires. Um, joining us this evening is Lori Truesdale. She is a new teacher in our therapeutic support program at Killam. Um, Lori's coming to us from Melrose, where she was a special education teacher, specializing both in the academics as well as the students who had these social emotional challenges. So she's a great fit for what we're looking for at Killam, and we're excited to have her join our team. 
Um, we also have two additional hires who aren't able to be with us this evening due to prior engagement. Um, so when you see them in the school, please welcome Melissa Kanata, who's our new halftime kindergarten teacher. She's coming from the Boston Public Schools where she was an integrated um, teacher in a second grade classroom. And um, I know Ms. Wilson will also introduce her, but we also have a new team chair at Killam. Uh, Shana Goldwyn will be joining us full time, um, also with a great background in literacy and special education. So we're excited to have her join our team. So welcome Lori and our other team members. I would like to now have Dr. Joanne King please come up and introduce her staff member. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us. I'd like to introduce Caitlin Rubin. She's our new speech and language pathologist at Wood End and is from our neighboring community, North Reading. She graduated from Northeastern University with a master's in speech and language pathology this past spring. So she just completed her clinical internships at the Leonard Florence Center for Living in Chelsea and the Boston, at Boston Children's Hospital. And she's also worked as a graduate clinician um, in Revere Public Schools and at the Boston Renaissance Charter School in Hyde Park. So she's worked with a wide range of clients from toddlers to senior citizens. So she's quite experienced. And I was told when I was doing the reference checks on her that she's not easily flustered. So this will be great. <laughs> <laughs> We're very excited to have her as part of the Wood End team. So we want to welcome Caitlin. Thank you, Dr. King. I would like to have the principal of Birch Meadow Please come forward, Julia Hendricks. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, I have three new teachers who couldn't be here this evening. Sean Keogh, who is a new Learning Center special educator. Aaron Gibson, a third grade special educator. And Ariel Mucha, who is a new general education fourth grade teacher. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And our last principal, Lisa Maria Bolito from Joshua Eaton Elementary School. Thank you everybody for having us. Again, I echo what Mrs. Levesque had said. It's a great evening to introduce our new staff. First, I'd like to introduce Ms. Miriam Lewis, who's a new fourth grade teacher at Joshua Eaton. She has received her bachelor's and master's degree from Endicott College, uh, and she is also licensed in moderate special needs. Next, I have um, uh, Ms. Carolyn Maas. We like to call her Linny. A lot of Carolines in our building. Um, and she is our new school psychologist, and she comes to us with a master's degree from Albany University. Um, and she's done a great job jumping right in day two. So. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have our new speech language pathologist, Lindsay Hicks, who's also, we need to congratulate her. She's a new mom. <laughs> She's a new baby at home. And she has a degree from Mass General's Institute for Health Professionals. Um, and she comes to us from her previous experience at Dearborn Academy. So welcome to Josh Wheaton and Reading Public Schools. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lisa Murray. Um, this time I'd like to have um, Christine Kelly please come up with uh, the introductions of her staff. Um, just, I know Chris has been already at a couple of meetings, but as you know, Chris last year was the Assistant Superintendent at Pentucket Public School. She's also been a principal in Woburn, Winchester, and Brookline. So, Chris. Come on up. So thank you for having us tonight. This is a wonderful Reading tradition, and I'm so proud to be part of it. I uh, had the very distinct honor of spending almost a week with this promising new class of Reading teammates, and I am excited. They are amazing, so thank you for that. Um, we have two new elementary, K-6, to they're actually working in the middle school as well, coordinators here in Reading, and uh, I am just very honored to have such strong teammates. They're 
they're, they're already hit the ground running and we're doing a lot of powerful work. Uh, Heather is not a new face to Reading. Um, I know you all know her. She has moved into the K-6 to STEM coordinator role after five years as the wonderful Barrows principal. She is a former math and science teacher, which is what generated her STEM love, as well as an assistant principal before coming to Reading. She's thrilled to be working in this new role and she sees it as an opportunity to broaden her scope around a district district wide lens working on a curriculum that she loves. So welcome Heather. And Allison Stryker is our new K-6 Humanities Coordinator. Allison comes with a wealth of experience in literacy, most recently as a literacy specialist in Lowell Public Schools, but she was also a reading specialist and literacy coordinator for the Winchester Public Schools. Allison has a master's degree in curriculum from Leslie, and she is an adjunct uh, teaching curriculum courses at, for American International College, and she is proud to share her love for literacy, and she's also a licensed principal so I have two wonderful uh, licensed principals working on my team. So I'm thrilled to present them to all of you. Thank you, Chris. Last but certainly not least, uh, Carolyn Wilson is going to introduce um, our, our new special education administrators. Right, so again, I'm excited to um, introduce to you the new staff we've hired. Um, unfortunately, our team chairs couldn't be here, but Allison is. So Allison Wright has joined us as the Assistant Director of Student Services. She, again, like Heather, is not a stranger to many of you. Allison is entering her fourth year here in Reading. She was the team chair for Parker Middle School and has moved into this position. Prior to being at Parker, she was um, working in the Granby Public Public schools as an assistant principal, team chair, and a special educator, and she has a master's in special ed from Westfield. Um, I also want to introduce the other team chairs and give you a little information on them because we're really excited about our team and think we have a good, strong team coming in. So Sherry Burke is joining us as the team chair for Birch Meadow and Barrows. She has um, she worked for eight years as, as a school adjustment counselor for the Beverly Public Schools and has been a team chair in Marlboro and in um, Clinton. Um, she attended Hofstra and then she went on to CW Post to get her master's. Um, Shana Goldwyn, as Ms. Levesque mentioned, is the team chair for Killam. Um, she worked most recently for the Gloucester Public Schools as their literacy coordinator district wide. Um, she also has worked as a team chair in Fitchburg. She was a professor at Fitchburg State. Um, she has a master's in education from Leslie and a PhD from Florida State University. Um, Alana Schoen is moving into the team chair position for Coolidge. Alana last year was a <coughs> .5 special ed teacher at Coolidge Middle School um, and prior to um, coming to Reading, she was the special ed administrator for the Marblehead Charter School. She has a master's degree from Simmons and another master's from Salem State and she has worked um, in her career as a special ed teacher, a general ed teacher and an administrator. And finally, for Parker Middle School, we are welcoming Leander Corman. Um, she is joining us from the Fitchburg Public Schools where she worked as a building-based special ed administrator. She has dedicated to her career to working with students with disabilities. She's been a counselor, a teacher, a consultant, and an administrator. She has her CAGS in educational leadership from Plymouth State. Um, she has a master's from Assumption College and her undergraduate degree is from the University of Maine. So we feel really excited about this strong team and I got to spend the afternoon with them which was great um, and we feel we're in a good position. Just one thank you Carolyn. Just one final comment. I, I want to thank Jen Bogue, our uh, Human Resource Administrator. Everyone that you saw here this evening and more uh, have gone through a hiring process which Jen um, is is very involved with. So I want to thank Jen for all of her hard work this summer uh, in making sure that all of our hirees are uh, are all up to date and ready ready to go to start the school year. So thank you, Jen. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take a two-minute recess just to clear out. Sure. <laughs> Unless you all want Unless you to want stay. stay.
call the, the meeting back to order. Uh, we'll uh, first do the uh, reorganization, and then we'll, uh, after that, we'll have the uh, building update presentation. So, Dr. Doherty, you want the... Thank you. As the gavel's coming down here, I just want to thank Mr. Robinson for his leadership this year. Obviously, this was a very challenging year um, uh, in terms of uh, an override uh, ballot question and other um, challenges that our school district and community faced. And I want to thank you for your leadership, and I really enjoyed working with you, as I have many times in your role as chair. So thank you. Thank you. In your packet is the policy on how um, the school committee reorganization works. We start first with receiving nominations for the position of chair, and then once we have a majority vote for chair, um, then the gavel goes to the newly elected chair, and then the newly elected chair would will take uh, nominees for vice chair. So do I have any nominations for chair? Does this work? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I will nominate uh, Ms. Elaine Webb for chair. Okay. We'll second that. We have a second. Okay. Any other nominations for chair? Okay. Hearing none. So I don't believe this is a roll call vote. No. No, it's not just a regular vote. Okay. So all in favor of Elaine Webb uh, being elected as chair of Sorry, the... Sorry, point of order. Yes. Say roll call vote. It is a roll call vote? Uh-huh. I apologize. I missed that. <laughs> okay, we're going to do a roll call vote. <laughs> you can tell I'm not a chair. <laughs> we're going to do a roll call vote. Um, all in favor of... Uh, well, a roll call vote. Ms. Wooden? Yes. Yes. Ms. Van Den Aken? Yes. Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Yes. Dr. Doxer? Yes. Ms. Borowski? Okay. So we have a 6 0 roll call vote. Congratulations, Mrs. Webb. We're going to give you a gallon. Okay, so then our next order of business is to um, take nominations for the Office of Vice Chair. Do I hear any nominations for vice chair? Mrs. Van Den Acker. Hi. Um, I'll nominate Dr. Doxer, please. Second. Second. That's excellent. Um, are there any other nominations for a vice chair? Nominate Ms. Borowski. And will that be seconded? Sure. Seconded. Okay, so we'll need to take a uh, roll call vote. Um, I believe we would for, we'll take a vote for the first first person. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, you need um, yes, yes. You need a you need a majority on the roll call vote. Okay, so we'll do a no. Actually, wait a minute. Yeah, we'll be a roll, call. roll yeah, call. Yeah, roll call, vote roll call vote. Yes. For, um, we'll do first roll call vote for those in favor of Mrs. Doxer as the in the position of vice chair. Mr. Bobbin? No. Mr. V Ms. Vandenacker? Yes. 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 And so I think that gets okay. gets our, our roll call five uh, to one vote and. Um, that, so that motion does carry, and Mrs. Doc, Dr. Doxer is uh, duly elected as vice chair, and I think the other nomination by default would fall off, or do we need to carry through? No, you, okay. you, yeah, it's the, once there's a majority. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just would like to say that um, I have enjoyed th this past year serving as vice chair with uh, Chairman Robinson, and I have um, enjoyed doing that. It's very challenging. I've served with um, Mr. Robinson before, and um, it was always a pleasure. So I look forward to uh, hopefully leading the community, I mean the committee this year and our uh, district and, and um, working with our community. And I am very much hoping for a slightly less challenging, actually a considerably less challenging year as we go forward this year than last year. So hopefully we um, 
we can really focus on taking some big steps forward. So um, our agenda tonight, what I'd like to do is, um, I'll, I'll call for public comment um, for items not on the agenda. Um, seeing none, we'll move past that item. Um, right now, I'm actually going to um, hold off on the consent agenda and the reports. We'll come back to that because we have um, uh, our director, facilities director Joe Huggins, and our town manager here to um, address the capital plan update. So I'd like to do the capital plan update, then we'll go back to the consent agenda and the reports. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. Um, so it's been a very busy summer. John and I were talking uh, with Gail the other day, and we noted that it was this summer was five days shorter than last year. So we had a great deal of work to get done in a very short period of time. We had, since July 1, we had 434 work orders come in, and we closed out 375 this summer. Um, it's not broken down by town and school, but a lot of that was preventive maintenance work we did within the buildings. Um, state mandated inspections and things of that nature. So this summer, obviously, we did our summer cleaning like we always do, floor refinishing, painting, and rug cleaning throughout all the schools. Like I said, we're mandated by the state of Massachusetts to perform testing on all of our uh, fire alarms, uh, elevators, fire suppression systems, um, things of that nature that we have to get done uh, in order to open school. And then along with that, we perform, perform the preventive maintenance on all of the uh, mechanical equipment in all of the uh, school buildings in town. Um, the, um, some of the additional projects we completed was uh, we built out a, a new kiln room, which was a ref grant. We finished that up uh, like the week before the, um, school started. Uh, we also did the life skills kitchen, um, which was a, um, a donation from Samantha's Harvest. We finished that up, which came out really nice. Um, we completed the wireless project in conjunction with the technology department here at the high school and all the other schools. All eight buildings got touched by that project. Um, Birch Meadow, we did some concrete work out in back to put new hatch covers on the steam tunnels, which have been abandoned since we went to a new heating system. But they were just rusted out and damaged, and we're going to install the new covers probably in the next week or so. But we had to have the concrete curbings rebuilt. Um, we also did quite a bit of um, work on roofs. Um, we do target the roofs in the capital plan, but we are heavily invested in doing preventive maintenance on the roof systems. And we touched Coolidge, Parker, Birch Meadow High School, and Wood End, and um, all with the um, you know the goal to to keep the life, uh, extend the life of the roofs, to avoid any uh, big dollar uh, repairs in the winter. Um, we also um, did some roof work at the Wood End School, and we did some painting of stairwells over there. We had some water infiltration that we that we fixed, and we also purchased some new wireless clocks for the uh, Killam Elementary School that we're going to be uh, installing in house very shortly. So this slide right here just shows some of the FY18 um, capital projects. Um, the Barrows Media Center uh, kind of trailed over into this year. We completed that. We had um, all the books taken out by a library moving company and cataloged, and then we installed new carpet tile, which is what we're going with across uh, the entire town, which is a, a better way to go than Broadloom. Uh, we finished that project. We also did uh, floor tile replacement in two rooms at Killam last year, some carpeting over at Parker in four rooms. We also uh, replaced the um, carpeting in the pack, which was everything all the way up to the stairs going to the back of the building, the up top area, and the Wood End Skylight Project, which is in progress. Um, so the Wood End Skylight Project has been, a, um, has been an interesting one. So we, we were delayed by um, the manufacturer of the skylights, um, the company that's building them is in Maine. It's called Wasco, and it's a high-quality product that we spec'd out. Um, and the frames and the glass are due to be delivered uh, next week. And we're going to be rigging those up onto the roof after hours, more than likely on a weekend. And we're going to let the contractor work um, in the, on the flat roof, assembling them. We're not doing any construction. It's just going to be putting the glass in the frames. And then the installation of the skylights will occur 
shortly thereafter on weekends. And we've gotten permission from the chief of police as well as the building inspector to do that. So no construction will be going on when there's anybody in the building and we've kept, kept people out of there on the weekends to do this. So we're pretty excited about that. Now in, in advance of that, we have the uh, roofing contractor come in. Uh, the, there's six, six individual skylight systems up there right now. And in the spec, it called for to have the roofing material peeled back away from the curbs of the existing units, the curbing. And we had all that work done in advance. So really, all we have to do now is take the old skylights off and place them on the curbs and flash into the shingles. So that was a big thing to get done over the summer. So we're ready now for the installation. Um, so we're excited about that. Uh, the, at this year for FY19, uh, we replaced uh, tile and five stairwell landings over at the Parker Middle School. Uh, we went with a, uh, a vinyl stairwell uh, a vinyl system over there, which is a longer lasting material. We're going to be doing work on the uh, Coolidge domestic hot water heater, which is in process. We're specking that out right now as we speak. We're also going to be doing carpeting here in the in this area right here we're standing in the media center. Uh, we've ordered the materials and we're just looking for a weekend to do that. More than likely, it'll happen over a holiday weekend or in the over the Christmas vacation. We think we can do it in two days. The high school boiler project um, is another big one. The filed sub bids for that project um, were received Monday. The general bids are due on the 10th of September, and then we'll know where we sit as far as the pricing goes. Ahead of that, what we did was we um, had a complete flush done of the system here at the high school. It's a glycol system, everybody knows about that. We had that flush three times and taken out in tanker trucks and had an inhibitor put in there to make sure that what the, the water that's in the system is treated properly to take these condensing boilers. The whole goal is to have the, the water as clean as possible in the system. That old boiler is gonna be demoed and taken away and we have three condensing boilers going in place of that which, will be a high, which is a high efficiency system. And that's it. I can answer any questions if anybody has anything. Joe, what is this elementary school master plan that's discussed with that? Will you give us more We're going to get to that in a minute. We're going to get to that in a minute. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll so, come to that. Anybody else any questions? Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. go to the Capitol? We can. Let's do that. So I'm just going to do an intro and then I'm going to mm -hmm. turn it over to um, Mrs. Dowd to talk about the memo. Um, so one of the things that uh, I know has, uh, we've been having discussions about for over a year now, has been the, um, you know, the, the what we're going to be looking at with uh, our elementary schools in terms of space based on program needs, mm -hmm. uh, which include things like special education programs. We've seen a significant increase in the number of programs uh, since 2005. Uh, in addition, uh, we have seen a significant increase in the number of families that have chosen full day kindergarten. Um, we're up to 89% this year for full day wow. kindergarten, which is our highest wow. ever. Um, so we do have those programs. Um, in addition to that, we have other space needs at our elementary school. We also know that um, we have been uh, continuing to maintain um, and uh, making updates and upgrades to, to the Killam Elementary School. And certainly there are some things though that we cannot do at Killam and unless we um, and unless we trigger some some other some other thresholds by by law, so um, you know we have those those things as well about killing. So one of the things that we felt, and we've been talking about this for over a year, that we needed to look at is what are the needs of all of our elementary schools in terms of um, space needs in from a learning and teaching perspective and how does that play in also to enrollment, um, future enrollment. We have not had an enrollment study done uh, for several years in the school district and 
then when you take a look at that, that master elementary plan, what, um, where does Kellum fit into all that? So over the last year, we've been working with um, school committee, we've been working with other groups, permanent building committee, town manager, um, Gail Dow, myself, Joe Huggins. And so um, what you're gonna hear from Mrs. Dow tonight and uh, Mr. Lasher is the first step in the process. So I'm gonna turn it over now again. So one of the items that, oh, I don't, oh. you need a mic. To oh, I'm sorry. So one of the items that was originally in the capital plan that we discussed a couple of meetings ago is that there was funding in there to do doors and window work at, actually mostly door work at two of the elementary schools. The facilities department maintains those on a regular basis, so we have deemed that there is no need to actually go about replacing those. So that capital is available within the capital plan currently that we are asking school committee and then it'll go forth to town meeting to basically repurpose that funding and we would include that within the total funding to do the enrollment slash census study that Dr. Doherty just spoke about. The other piece of, of this, um, which I will do, and I'm sure the town manager will correct me if I am, am wrong on this, as part of the override, as people may remember, we also included funding to go towards capital as well as benefits. So each line item that we had in the override had a specific amount of capital also attached to that. That money was, I'm gonna say, placed in the permanent building committee line item. It was sort of an unearmarked amount of money that was included within the capital plan. So that is when we go through the memo where we're potentially targeting the funding to be able to come from is to basically assign that money that was approved as part of the override. So the, the goal would be to first do the enrollment census study to make sure we have updated numbers, especially looking at what, how the population has changed within the town with some of the building projects that are going on just to make sure we're looking at as correct numbers as you can. The next step that we've talked about amongst ourselves with the town manager is also Mrs. Webb and Mr. Robinson attended meetings with the permanent building committee to understand the process that they have and this is actually one of the recommendations that they had before we can even embark on a building project we need to make sure we do a master plan study. So that would be to look at all of the elementary schools, the enrollment, the programs, because what we do not want to do is go forth and propose a building project without truly understanding the needs of the elementary schools and how to best approach that because you don't want to necessarily tear down or build a new building without fully understanding all of the space needs. So what we've done is put forth a request in order to obtain the funding to do that. These are based on estimated numbers um, that Mr. Huggins and I have talked to various consultants out there and th th this is a range. Obviously, once this was approved, we would have to go through the official procurement process in order to procure the right people, but this is a ballpark estimate based upon what we understand the figures to be. And then at that point, once we receive the master plan study, we would be able to assess it and determine what the next appropriate steps would be. Can I just make a statement? Yeah. So I just wanted to emphasize uh, what Mrs. Dowd said. Uh, we and a, a year ago now, yep. uh, formed the permanent building committee, and this was a recommendation that they came back with. So, uh, we're, it's, it was not done in a vacuum; it was done from advice from that committee. So. Mm -hmm. And if I can add one other thing, I was in the meetings with Mr. Robinson, but I was also on the um, served on the school committee during the building project of the high school and uh, Wood End and Barrows. And at that time, we did not have the permanent building committee, and it was uh, very difficult. And I just want to say that I was, when uh, we had um, one of the meetings uh, earlier this summer with the permanent building committee, um, Mr. Huggins was also there. Um, I was really impressed with the process that they put together. They have worked very hard on their process. They're working very hard on sort of developing their rubric for investigating and evaluating buildings. 
but their overall process, what was really clear from them was that um, we were not, there was work to be done, foundational work, that would be captured in this uh, master planning study. And I know that um, Mr. Huggins has some overarching sort of um, mechanisms for doing that, and that after we do that work and we know directionally and we understand enrollment and needs and programming and building needs, and then we would be able to take the be in the position of st beginning to engage the permanent building committee on a building project. And I think they're going to be an amazing resource for us. Um, and I, um, you know, so whether you know when that gets when those things get started at whatever whatever committee is uh, in place or whatever um, members are on the committee at the time it's going to be a real asset but I can see the you know there's a, um, a level of planning you know in construction you measure twice and cut once because you can't recut it if you make it too short so this I see as you know th taking those very proactive steps to appreciate everybody's time Mrs. Doctor um, I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that in terms of planning for where we're going to cut and not cutting short, that this study will also cover the early childhood needs, the rise. Pre so through. who's coming? Yes. 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 Thank you. Great. Um, Mr. Lalashar. Um, thank you, Elaine. Um, just to add on to everything you've said, which is accurate, at uh, town meeting, um, we were still in a bit of a state of euphoria that the override had passed, and I certainly didn't want to jinx it by doing too much work in advance. 5% um, of the override was just over $200,000. Um, as we amended the motion on the floor, because an override uh, budget was the second uh, portion of, a, of, a, of the main description, um, what I said was that these, these capital funds would be put in the permanent building committee line but they were intended to help with the school enrollment or the uh, elementary space uh, issue. That could be kill them, but that could be broader than kill them. Um, perhaps at the time, uh, in retrospect, I could have asked for a second line item to be uh, not called permanent building committee, because I was, as Elaine has said, I was familiar with a very detailed process they have. And if you imagine a timeline for a project, let's just say the PBC jumps in somewhere in the middle, but not at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So some of us met with the chair and the vice chair over the summer, and they emphasized again, no, we're not going to take that money and do what you want. You do that. So really, this is the same purpose that was announced at town meeting. We just are going to ask to move it into a separate line, not called permanent building committee, and called something like elementary uh, space study. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Mrs. Borowski? Thank you. Um, I have a question about doors. Um, can you articulate a little bit um, how they came to be on the capital plan and how you came to determine that they don't, in fact, need to be replaced? And, and my uh, the second question, are we putting it out a few years, or do they genuinely not need No, work? we, we it, doors and windows, doors and windows are something that we do target on the capital plan if you look at the categories we have. Um, and the doors at those, it's Birch Meadow and, Birch Meadow. and Eaton, I believe. I think so, yeah. yeah. Yes. We've done a tremendous amount of that stuff in-house is, is what it boils down to. And sometimes it's a, an, a type of thing where we don't want to wait, and we might do it if we can, some of that out of operating, and we're not paying prevailing wage, so we're saving a tremendous amount of money by doing that. So that's how we've addressed a lot of this stuff. And if you were to drive around like both of those buildings, and, and really it's more the exterior doors in, in these buildings. Um, we have done some interior at Birch Meadow, but you know th that's a big issue. Doors are a big issue at our buildings because the use is crazy. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly doing door work, and, we, and when we get in inspected by the fire department and the um, building inspector before school opens, that's the thing that they're looking for. Can the doors all be opened easily and can people egress out? So we, if we have a door that becomes an issue, whether, whether it might be a rod issue or a hardware issue, we, we jump on it right away. So, Thank you. Okay. Mr. Barr? Oh, sorry, Ms. Barr. No, no, no. Go ahead. So I'll, I'll stay with the doors. For now, then I have questions about the, um, the master plan study, as I incorrectly asked you. So on the, on the question about what we're using the money from the doors for, which is 
missed out as I read this at school enrollment study. So Correct. it would be basically the combination of all of the funding would go towards the enrollment study, which from what we have been explained to by the permanent building committee as well as speaking to some of the other agencies that do this is that's really the first step that you do is an enrollment slash census study to mm -hmm. look at what the population trends are and try to project those so forward for a I, I period can tell you of time. what the trends are right now. It's 4,300 students plus or minus 2% because that's what it's been for the last 15 years. I'm having a hard time thinking to myself, if I vote for this, how am I going to go to a taxpayer who says, why, doesn't, why do you need an enrollment study when, A, the enrollment in Reading has been remarkably stable in the last 15 years, and B, why do it now if we're planning with the select board to have all kinds of new development, new housing coming in, which we've heard at select, select board meetings, wouldn't, wouldn't we want to wait until we see who moves into those units and then do a study? Because that's, like, where are all these extra people going to come from and why does it cost $20,000 to do a study when a number is remarkably stable over 15 years? No, Dr. Darty. Sure. So most school districts do enrollment studies every seven to 10 years. Uh, we haven't done an enrollment study since early 2000s. Um, the purpose of an enrollment study is to take a look at not only what currently exists and what exists in the past, but they're looking at uh, future developments, future housing, and how that's going to impact the schools. So this actually is a really good time to do that because a lot of these developments are happening and they're, they're beginning to um, take fruition. So what they do is they project outward and they look at different percent increases. Um, so that is the purpose of the enrollment study. And this is the time to do it because if we are gonna do an elementary master plan, we need to also know is enrollment going to be an issue or is it just gonna be programmatic needs that we need to look at. So the enrollment piece is a key part of the puzzle because if we're now going to see a 5% increase in our enrollment consistently over the next few years, which I don't know, I'm just saying, it, plus we have additional programmatic needs, then that means we need additional classroom space beyond just the programmatic needs. So the information from the enrollment study is gonna help feed the uh, master plan study. Um, Mr. Bobbin, and so then Mrs. Fanta. That, that's helpful. So, I mean, what I'm interested in is what is twenty thousand dollars about right for what any district would pay? When did we last do our last enrollment study? And, and kind of give give us some context for the taxpayer to understand: is twenty thousand, you know, a middle of the road cost for an enrollment study? I mean, this is not something. That, anybody does frequently from what you're saying if you're only doing it every 10 years seven to ten years is when most school districts and, do it. and we're outside of 10 at this point right and the cost the 20,000 where did we get that number and was it competitive? so that um, NASDAQ is one of the, I'm just using that as an example that's one of the companies that that does uh, enrollment studies um, and the, it ranges between 15 to twenty thousand dollars so we took the high end to be conservative. So do we look at multiple vendors for this enrollment study? In order to do this, if the funding was approved, we would follow the procurement laws. So since it is over $10,000, we would be required to obtain three written quotations. And then we would go from there based on assessing them and looking at their skill set. So it would follow a very prescribed process to hire the consultant to do it. So we're asking okay. for a number that's on a high end of one estimate that we received? Nope. We're, we're asking to, for, for the funding to be put there, and then the, that budget then will go out and follow procure, procurement, and then we may spend less than that, but I think the point is you, it, it is in the range. But it's a single data point that we base that 20000 on, that estimate. I believe no, it's based on historical cost of an enrollment study I, for a district our size. That's, I, I, if I could, if I could just clarify, and Bob, you know, in, if I'm incorrect, this money is already in the capital budget. Right. It's not, we're not asking for money that is yeah. outside of, it's of the heard, budget. Okay. I, I heard that, and I also heard that it was about 200000 total that we had earmarked for this. So this is spending all our money. So if we, don't, if we spend it here, we can't spend it somewhere else later. That, that's where I, my mind is on this. 
Miss um, Vandenecker, just one second. Sure. So I believe in the, uh, one of the meetings we had this summer with the Permanent Building Committee, um, Mr. Huggins also commented that this was the range, that this was the range. We talked about this in terms of um, resources that he's familiar with. So That is correct. But it was yeah. not just the, um, it was certainly a perspective from Dr. Darty as well as a perspective from um, Director Huggins. Um, this, was not, this was not earmarked for an enrollment study. It was earmarked for capital. The, the 20,000 is still be capital. This is still it's capital. capital. It's all it within wasn't the capital specifically, plan. what I heard Bob say is it wasn't specifically given to the voter as in the budget as a school enrollment study. It was just a capital expense for the school. Well, there's, right. there's two different things. The 20,000, though, which is moving from the doors and windows, right? right that was That's in the capital plan. It's moving from doors and windows to address the enrollment study. The 207,000 is the money that Separate Mr. Topic. Right, Mr. Lalasher referred to. Right. I'll let others speak. Thanks. Mrs. Van Den Acker. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to understand the study a little better because even if like the overall enrollment numbers have been pretty consistent over time, I imagine there's art and science to a study like this. Would it help us start to see, for instance, yeah, maybe your district isn't going to grow much more, but you're going to have a lot more kids in elementary versus high school mm -hmm. or in this part of town versus that part mm -hmm. of town That's or great. needing you know, maybe these kinds of programs versus those kinds of programs. So it isn't just about how many children in general. It's also kind of a best estimate about it, where they'll be, correct. what grades they'll be in. It's best whatever. estimate looking at trending historically as well as going forward. They look at population shifts. Do you have, I'm going to get in trouble saying this one, older individuals? potentially moving out, younger yep. families moving in, are they younger families that may have children five to seven years from now? So then you look at that and say your elementary population may pop up. So it sort of looks at every way you can slice and dice the population. So it's looking at where do they think the needs and bubbles would be based right. upon the aging of the town, new people coming in, people moving out looking at overall trends throughout this area as well as the country to say what on average how yeah. many children are people That's having. Right. So it's looking at mm -hmm. as scientific as you can be looking at that information, which it would not be an expertise we would have internally to be able to look at that data, cull it all together and come up with. And again, what you're trying to do is look out long term because what you don't want to do is build the wrong school at, in the wrong size at the wrong location. Right. So this is to sort of help look at all of that, which is where the second phase of the master plan study of the elementary schools itself feeds off of the census data that you do. Okay, this may be uh, answering a question I'll ask later, but um, I just wanted to say, I think, it, didn't our, isn't our kindergarten population about 10% higher this year than it was last year? For instance, the last two years of our kindergarten have been higher than the previous two years. That so is that's like an example, even of how, even though our overall student census might even be going down a little bit, where those students are, it wasn't fully predictable. So. Correct. I think we're around right. 320 right now for our kindergarten. Yes. All right. Thanks. You know what, I'd like to, uh, Ms. Borowski, um, two questions. I just want to clarify that any study is also going to take into account the modulars and their yes. projected lifespan. Yes. Okay. Good. And um, can you talk a little bit about how this connects to the locker report? That was six or seven years ago. This locker report right here? That was just before my time on this committee. So um, in 2011, which is when the work was done with the locker report, I know it was released in 2012, but the work was actually done in 2011. Um, we had Frank Locker come in and do, it wasn't a comprehensive drill down study, but it was enough to give us information on um, what our next step should be. So the Frank Locker report took a look at, um, it took all, it took existing data, such as enrollment, um, such as our space needs. It took a look at all of the schematics of our um, five elementary schools at the time. Uh, there were no modulars at the time. Um, and to truly see what were our needs, what were our programmatic needs, all of those things. It has good information in it. I'm not, I'm not dismissing that. And we're, 
if the next steps we take as part of the elementary planning, I would assume that the locker report would be used as a piece of the data. However, the locker report did not did, was looking at the snapshot at that time. And it gave us good information because it did talk about using the superintendent's option and how you could, you know, make the, the redistricting lines a little bit blurred so that you could balance class sizes better. We've used that practice um, as a result of that. It took a look at modulars and where you could put modular classrooms, um, which we did use that information a few years later. So it did, it did serve a useful purpose. But a lot of things have happened in the last seven years um, in our district and in education. A number of our special education programs have increased. As I mentioned earlier, the participation rate for full day kindergarten is now at an all time high in Reading. Um, our preschool population, you know, we've added additional sub separate classrooms, but we also have a waiting list each year for preschool. Um, you know, so those are the types of things that the, the report is going to need to look at. Um, in addition to when it was looking at enrollment, it did not take into account additional projects that, that were being, that developments that were going on in town. And Ms. Brackley, very quick follow up. Um, so just to clarify, that report would be used in any future work, whatever is still valuable and pertinent. It, it probably has good data that can good. be used for, yes, as part, of, as part of it, yes. Thank you. Thanks. I'd like to just ask um, Ms. Uh, Dr. Doxer to read the first motion and let's get that on the table and then we can continue discussion. Oh. Yeah, I just, can I, I'd like to put the motion on the table first. Could you please? Move to approve the shift of funding from existing door work to complete a school enrollment study in the amount of $20,000 within the FY19 capital plan. Second. Second. And just to clarify that this $20,000, um, according to, as was confirmed by Mr. Lalashur and Mr. Huggins and Ms. Dowd, is currently in the capital plan, um, currently under a line item for doors and windows, and we would be moving it to this new line item. And also just, it is allocated to the schools in the, in, in in the, the current plan as well. Okay, Ms. Bond. Yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to an enrollment plan on its face. I'm, I'm uninformed about the comparative costs of these plans across different districts. I don't know whether 20K is low or high or about right. Maybe it's about right. You know, I don't know. Uh, it strikes me that we're barely a month into FY19 and we're already spending our money on doors on something else. Um, I would be much more interested in hearing this request before spring town meeting and to, to just hold this money until then because we're still in FY19, right? So. We, we can, it's our, it's money allocated for FY19, I understand that, but we're, there are two town meeting events, right? There's, there's the fall and the spring meeting. I would rather hold this 20K back for doors, windows, ceilings, boilers, anything else that happens within the schools that might happen over the winter. And then in the spring come back, and if we don't need the money, then, and for something else that goes wrong during the winter or between now and then, then I would be more supportive of, and if I had some comparable bearings and evidence in the packet for the public to say, this is a reasonably priced school study. It's about what school studies should cost. The school committee didn't need any money um, that was allocated for doors and windows for other capital expenses during the winter. Um, now is the right time to authorize and ask the, uh, the town meeting for additional money or to move the money. But, I, I don't want to move money around right now, and I don't support this right now. I'd like to hear from Dr. Doherty, and then we'll um, so Mr. So we share. would not be able to use this money for anything else but the doors and windows at these two schools at this point, because town meeting needs to change the uh, the purpose of the funding. So even if there was a capital project that we felt that could be used for this, town meeting would have to approve it to change it. And I would I would want to make that request. I mean, we just heard from Mr. Huggins how important doors and windows are. We don't expect there to be a problem. We don't know what's going to happen. We're, like I said, we're barely a month into the fiscal year. Why are we spending the money? Why are we so quick to spend the money now? We've been given the money by the taxpayer, by the town meeting. We have a line item for that. If we do need new doors and windows, let's pay for those with this money. If there's leftover money or we don't need the money, then let's make this change in the spring. I don't see why that's not a sensible alternative. Okay, Mr. Bob, just, uh, Mr. Larshar, did you have a uh, statement? So I believe just from what I heard, I have one thing. Mr. Huggins 
just talked to us and said that he felt that this was appropriate, that the doors and windows are in excellent shape and they've, they've done a thorough review. I just want to say in a bigger picture perspective, in 2016, before the failed override, we were talking about space issues and concerns that we had and enrollment and would we be able to fill, have the capacity for programmatic needs. And we continue to talk about that year after year after year. We have spent in the last three years on this committee, we have had to address issues that had to do with um, having our special education programs in suboptimal space. And, and, and we don't want to be in that place again. And I think doing this, taking these steps to do this study, as well as the master planning, and doing it before we have another issue or before you know, we, we find ourselves again saying, you know, we, we talk about space frequently, we talk about the, the need to assess that capital, but we don't take action. And I think the Permanent Building Committee, when we spoke to them, made it very clear that these were really critical steps for us to take if we're going to then take the next steps forward. I also recall less than a year ago, there were lots of uh, meetings uh, filled with uh, parents who were, were at that time asking us to do something about Killam. This is not just about Killam. This is the way that we move forward and we take a, a bigger perspective um, and we look at all of our elementary needs. And, you know, this is the, the A step. I believe, I, Mrs. Dowd had said, um, if the, um, all of that funding is not needed because we get better quotes, then that line item eventually could be transferred back to doors and windows. Um, but Mr. Lalisher, do I understand correctly that if once, if we, if the committee were to support this motion, then at um, November, is it November, yeah. where am I? November. 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 Yeah. November or April? No, it's November. November. This would be the November. Oh, no, yeah. At November town meeting, then the town meeting would be taking a vote to actually move that line item. Is that true? As I understand it right now, um, staff has done repairs on the doors that were thought to need a capital replacement. So that money is not needed. So my suggestion as of right now is give back the 20000 period. If the school committee wants to use it for some other purpose, that's fine. You just have to ask town meeting for it. But you do not need that 20000 that was appropriated by town meeting and more. That's what Mr. Huggins was telling you. Um, it's certainly in your purview to ask it to be redirected at something else. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but you can't, as John said, you can't just kind of set it aside and if something else is needed, it can be used for it. It can only be used for things that have already been repaired. Thank you. Ms. Sparowski. Um, just a comment. I, that was really interesting, Mr. Bobbin, so thank you for sharing that because it was thought-provoking. I'm comfortable supporting this because you're touching on what I think is a balance. So when we say we're going to spend money in a certain way, you want to live up to that, right? Of course, the, the community expects it and it's important. On the other hand, I've certainly had a lot of conversations over the last few years with people who say, why did you move money from here to here? And the answer is, well, because 18 months ago, we had no idea that X, Y, and Z. So I, I would want to balance the desire for full transparency and accountability to the taxpayers with a certain amount of organizational agility, right? We've got to be able to, to, to react to the situation <coughs> on the ground. Um, so for me, this falls into that category. Um, the, the amount is relatively small, $20,000. And the only other thing I would add, um, and I'm, I'm stepping a smell, I'll look to Mr. Lalasher if I mischaracterize it, but I don't think, my, my impression of town meeting and before this served on the Finance mm -hmm. Committee, it's all that atypical to move capital around in the capital plan to say, oh, we thought we would need a new truck, but we don't. So we're going to push that out two years and instead we're going to fix the slide that broke and nobody knew the slide was going to break and vice versa. So it doesn't strike me as something town meeting would be all that un unused to seeing or not anticipate. But I think you bring up some really good points. Um, Mrs. Vandenacre and then Dr. Dox. Would you like to go first? Mine is just a quick line in that I don't think this will be, it shouldn't be a surprise sure. to anybody at the town meeting because it was mentioned that there would be capital money um, allocated for the study leading up to figuring out what needs there are for Kill. So I don't think this should be a surprise. Thank you. Sure. Ms. So my question might be uh, looking too forward, and if it is, tell me and we'll put it on the floor and pick it up afterwards. Could I better, are we going to talk more about the um, master plan? 
or a separate motion? Is that the separate, separate motion? motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll ask this part now, and then maybe you'll want to answer it when that motion's on the table. I'd love some context, because I think some of you were on the overall space need study where we were looking at like St. Agnes School and all of that a few years ago. So can you help um, those of us catching up here to understand what kinds of enrollment numbers were we using then and what kinds of space studies were there? I imagine we used this report. Was there another one? So how does this new master um, enrollment study, the enrollment study and the master study, how does that dovetail with that work that was has been done in those phases over time? Um, so enrollment wasn't the main focus of the last, of the St. Agnes, uh, reviewing the St. Agnes uh, building the, to see if we could use it. Yeah. Uh, what we were looking at is, is that we had some elementary space needs right. um, in that part of town. Um, and that building where it was located was actually in a perfect area where we could expand elementary school. Um, Areas and so it's the programmatic, and it, since I think I've been talking about this now since 2010, it's the programmatic that's been driving our elementary space needs, which is what resulted in the modules a few years ago, mm -hmm. um, the six the six module of classrooms. So the St. Agnes wasn't an enrollment piece; it was it was really driven by uh, the programmatic needs. The locker report helped for that helped look at that. Uh, St. Agnes area um, as a potential solution to some of the needs that were expressed in this report. So that was an elementary space needs to um, process that committee and is that right? Well you did no okay. No. Not the locker but the St. Agnes one you said it was looking there, at elementary space needs. I'm well there was there was multiple um, yeah, there have been several steps yeah. and layers. Yes. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that with the master plan once okay. we put the master Fine. planning Thank on you. the well, table. Well, the St. Agnes was I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Robinson. Was we were looking at options for uh, full day kindergarten. Kindergarten. Yes, kindergarten. For, for everybody in the district we had some intel at the time that we would get more chapter 70 money yeah, and right. all of that and uh, St. Agnes was, was was where we were going to try and put that and for safety reasons that didn't happen. It was traffic was a big, yeah, was a big drive. Yeah. That, but traffic and parking. So, yeah, that, that was clearly, to use Dr. Darty's term, was a pro, programmatic, uh, which was the program being full day kindergarten. So that's why we didn't have a bunch of studies then, because it was really kind of focused on the full day kindergarten piece right. of it. So we didn't necessarily need the enrollment study then and all these other studies. That's right. Okay, correct. thank you Mr. for helping me understand that. So just to be clear, Locker is not an enrollment study, correct? No, the Locker has an enrollment piece in it, but it really did, wasn't a full-blown enrollment study. It used existing data. I understand. Okay. It's the same thing I was doing. Uh, I have a question. I, I think the town manager would be kind of, I have a question about a comment that he made earlier. Would, would he be kind enough to answer a follow-up question? Oops. I just want to understand how the process works. I want people to understand how the process works. So what I, what I, so with the 20,000 in the line, I want to return to that. And it was, it was originally in a budget for capital expense for schools, doors and windows repair. We heard from Mr. Huggins. We don't, you don't need the full 20,000. Is that when you say the school committee could return it, I heard you use the words return it to the budget or repurpose it. That's my paraphrase, but those were options that we have. Is is it within, the, as you understood, the, the way the school committee and the town work together on the town side, is, is it the school's committee money, is the money allocated to the school committee for the full fiscal year? So let's say there's a door or window problem that falls within this line item. At, let's say we move this money in, in November, either to an enrollment study or, or we return it. And then suddenly we needed it in December, January, February. What happens then? I mean, if, if, we, if we don't do anything tonight and don't vote for this, do we, does the 20000 stay as a line item for schools to spend on doors and windows and we just spend some of it later? Or is, is that, was it only to repair doors and windows prior to this point in FY19? 
Mr. Lasher. Thank you. Um, the capital plan calls it out as 10,000 each in two schools for something called doors and windows. So in theory, it could be a door, it could be a window in either school. Um, you can do nothing, in which case, if no door or window money is spent on those two schools this year, at the end of this year, it'll go back to free cash. At the end of the year? At the end of the year. If you know you're going to do nothing, you could declare it as effectively not useful money in November town meeting and, and give it away, meaning effectively give it to free cash then. Um, if you have some other purpose for it, you could ask for it to be transferred into somewhere else. Um, if a need for doors or windows throughout the district comes up during the year, in theory, that 10,000 can only be used in the two schools it was allocated. If a problem is at those schools, yes, it could be used. If a problem is at another school, no, it cannot. Now, as a practical matter, 10,000 is such a small amount. Um, facilities budgets for unanticipated repair work throughout the district. So my guess is uh, it could quite easily handle 10 or $20,000 of unexpected door or window repair in any school without needing this 20,000 per se. But the capital plan's important to plan. You know, that's, it's a long-term 10-year plan for expected repairs needed um, that, you know, as opposed to unanticipated uh, things that break or, or wear out sooner than expected. And again, the repairs were made as opposed to new doors installed, and the repairs were found to be quite satisfactory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Downing. <coughs> Thank you. Mary Ann Downing, 13 Heather Drive. Um, forgive me if I, I'm touching on something that I missed before you came in. You're, you're a little ahead of the schedule. I had sent some of you an email this afternoon. It was obviously very long. Mentioning the locker report, and I'm glad Dr. Darty brought it. Can he just tell me more about the um, enrollment piece of it? I think it was called the Dijong Healy. It was like 20 pages that projected out to 2027. Why, why is that insufficient to? It did not take into account um, any future developments that were that were projected at that time. What do you there mean? Are several, there are several developments going on right now that were not in any planning phase in 2012. Referring to buildings, housing, the, a change in the, in the reuse of housing in Reading, as well as the developments, which I think there's something like 250 units on the table. Right. I mean, I think if you let, listen to the MAPC, that they'll try to convince you that our, our town population is aging and that none of these developments are going to be bringing kids and that's why they want to support them. I mean, they have a whole other spin on these developments. And my other comment, and you haven't gotten to the um, elementary ma master plan part, so you were discussing it as I came in. Forgive me if I... Wait, that motion's actually not on the table, so we haven't actually discussed that fully. Okay, I was just going to ask, is, can, can we hear this, the school, what amount of that money is for the schools versus the other buildings because it wasn't clear. So I'd like to wait till we yep. get, put that motion on the table and we'll, we'll discuss and, and just a last question before I sit down. So I signed up for public comments and I have a very unrelated question. Can I do that at the end of the meeting? Or if I missed public comment, it's just very unrelated to this. Uh, yeah, we'll see. I, let's see how the discussion goes and when the end of the meeting actually is. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so there's a motion on the table. It was seconded. If there's any further discussion about the motion, which just to review is to approve the shift of funding from the existing door work, um, school window and door, which is in the capital plan, as Mr. Lalashore elaborated, um, in for two specific schools, and to um, move that to complete a school enrollment study in the amount of $20,000 within the FY19 capital plan. Sorry, do you mind if I make one more comment? Sure, <laughs> Thank Samantha you. I appreciate it. So um, about this other enrollment study, um, we haven't had exactly an analogous situation in higher ed, but we do do a lot of studies. Um, and so it, I, I'm comfortable with the $20,000 number just because other kinds of projection, enrollment projection kinds of studies I've seen, actually we pay a heck of a lot more for it, to be honest with you. And my understanding of them, too, is that 
chances are better that the data is going to be pretty accurate in the first five years of the study. You get out to eight, nine, 10, 15 sure. years in the accuracy. You don't have, you wouldn't bank on it yep. as much. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Bobbin. Yeah, but so just to clarify that, we haven't done a study since 2001 or two. The one in we haven't done a full-blown enrollment. No, full this was not a full-blown enrollment study. It was right. taking a look at historical data. So I want to thank the town manager, Mr. Huggins, for their helpful participation tonight. I mean, what I, what I heard as a committee member is that this was money that was earmarked or earmarked that was originally budgeted to repair doors and windows at two schools to replace them. We didn't need to spend that money. I believe the right thing to do is give the money back to the town right now because we don't have a foreseeable need for it. I think it's improper for this committee to reach in and start new things like school enrollment studies with money that was allocated for doors. I think it doesn't help our credibility with town meeting. Um, I think it's completely inappropriate, and I'd like to have a separate discussion. If we want to spend $20,000 of taxpayer money on an enrollment study, that may be the right thing to do. I just don't want to do it this way. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to make one comment. I, I feel like um, this is, we are being transparent. Um, I believe that Mrs. Borowski said we need, to, we need some level of agility. We have our town partners here. And I think it's very clear, it has been made very clear to us through the Permanent Building Committee, um, through our long history of um, doing repairs on uh, Killam School, that if, that we need to take some steps forward. And I believe, I do see that we have a critical and an important need to support our school district. And um, so I, I would um, respectfully disagree with Mr. Bovin's, um portrayal of, of our committee as acting in anything less than a transparent way. Could I just add one more thing before you, before you take a vote? In order for us to move forward with an elementary planning study, which would actually be the second vote, yes. you have to do an enrollment study. So you can't do one without the other. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have the motion, it was seconded, we've sort of restated it. Is there any further discussion? And I'd like to call for a, a vote. Um, we'll start, Ms. Browski. Yes, is it roll call? Oh, we don't need a roll call. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> We're not in executive session. All those in favor? <laughs> Raise your hands. Aye. Any opposed? And the motion carries 5 1. Okay, so the. Um, I want to have Mrs. Doxer read the second motion and then we can get into the dialogue with uh, Mrs. Dowd and uh, Mr. Huggins. Move to request additional funding to perform an elementary master plan study in the amount of $207,500. Okay. Second. Seconded by Mr. Bobbin. Um, so who's going to lead that discussion? Is we have Mr. Huggins or Ms. Dowd? So or I, I, can, I can certainly I, begin I, it. I, I can definitely kick it off. I, as we talked about, this is phase two so once we have the enrollment and the census study to understand as accurately as you can predict out into the future the second piece of it is to utilize that information and do a complete analysis of our space needs which takes into account the census looking at the age the population what's coming through but also the programmatic needs looking at all of our current programs the space needs of those from kindergarten pre-K special education to make sure that the space itself is being utilized and determined in the appropriate way. And as we had mentioned earlier, this was one of the very strong recommendations we received from the Permanent Building Committee because what we do not, we, we've heard the community speaking about the concerns they have about certain of the elementary schools. But before we go forth, to come up with any proposal that we would want to bring forth to the community and the voters. We want to make sure we have as solid of a plan and understanding of what the needs are. Again, we do not want to build a building, tear down a building, add to a building, and have it not satisfy the needs of the community such that we're back here three years after we do it saying, we built it in the wrong place, we built it on the wrong building, and we didn't take into account the actual needs of the community. Again, this is an expertise that we would be looking to bring in the right people that understand this process to do the study for us. And again, they're, they're both coupled, which is why we're looking to be able to do mm -hmm. them at the same, pretty much at the same time, because A feeds into B, and again, 
we feel that in order to bring anything forward to both the permanent building committee, this committee, and the town as a whole, we need to make sure we are as solid as we can with exactly what the needs are before we can even attempt to come up with a dollar figure for renovating or mm -hmm. building a building. Could I, um, Mr. Lawler, sure? Thank you. Um, for the first year and a half, I met just about monthly with the building committee, permanent building committee, and two of the loudest uh, voices in the room were members of the library building committee. And if you think back to a blizzard, I can't remember, I think it was February. February. <laughs> yeah, I knew John would remember, where we met in the field house for a special town meeting. Um, Bill Brown didn't make it, but most others did. Later I found out I should have given him a ride. One of the criticisms, and this was for a second round of funding for the library, one of the round criticisms of town meeting was do a much better job up front. We don't want to see you here again like this. And the pill, and actually Mr. Berman at that uh, moment in several discussions proposed a permanent building committee as a solution to that issue. Um, it's been an acknowledged issue, certainly with the library, possibly with the high school, that not enough groundwork was done. And so the, the building committee spent, again, a good 18 months designing a process, all kinds of diagrams, all kind of expert discussion, and really are going to be very tough for you get a, to get a project through. You're going to have to do your homework. It's not going to be like it was in the past where, well, there's a grant out there, well, let's just build something, and it's not going to work. Doesn't mean you might be able to go around them to town meeting, but the building committee will not support anything that's not thoroughly done um, and very professionally done. And, and I think that's the right thing, and I think that's what town meeting has wanted. Mm -hmm. Could, could I ask, Mr. Huggins, could I just ask you to perhaps um, talk a little bit about what the master planning study, just uh, committee members may not know what it includes, and I think you're familiar with that, or? Um. I'm not completely familiar on the whole process, but I will tell you that they're going to look at the conditions of the existing buildings that we have in the town of Reading, uh, the age of the buildings, and how they're used, uh, the systems in, within the facilities. Um, how they're maintained. Uh, they'll look at um, access to the buildings, you know, traffic flow in and around the facilities and things like that. It's pretty comprehensive. Um, one of the things we've done with the Permanent Building Committee is to, um, they've developed an assessment tool um, that we will be able to hand to the folks that do the master plan. We're um, actually have, we're gonna probably have the elementary schools all in the assessment tool very shortly, within the next two months. Um, but the assessment tool takes into account the condition of all the buildings and it looks at everything. Um, looks at, you know, the condition of the exterior of the building, it looks at uh, the landscaping outside, looks at roof systems. And we've taken all the information that I have, uh, my department has within our work order system and our inventory asset management system, and that is going into that assessment tool. So that's, that's the type of information that they, they, they're going to ask for. There's going to be a big information transfer going to the folks to do the master planning. So it's going to be very comprehensive, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not going to be an overnight thing either. It's going to take a while to do it. I would imagine it's probably going to take at least six months to complete something like that, uh, based on what I've seen. And do we feel like the um, the funding, the 207000 is that? Um we consulted with a couple of different folks. Um, one of them is a company that we do work with right now uh, in the town of Reading, and one of them was the work, uh, the people that did the uh, OPM work services, and they felt that that was an acceptable range for an elementary master plan. master plan study. Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. So just want to back up to the... Um, the enrollment study that we just had. So, so what's the timeline on that? Uh, how long does that take? Uh, and when will we have that? Uh, we will not be able to start that until it goes through tell, town tell meeting. Me, so, tell yeah. me, and then after, after that, that, we would then need to draw up the specifications and send it out to receive quotes for it. So since it is over 10,000, we will have to send it out to a minimum of three, get the information back, assess it, and then award it. So even after we receive the funding, it will be a couple of months before we can even assign and award a contract to anyone. And then from there, I would imagine it's probably a couple so, of months. Worth yeah, it's, of work a couple, it's about a couple of months' well. work when it's all in the problems. Yes. So uh, even. 
I know we said the two were tied together. Uh, we, so, uh, not so much tied together. We had to approve the first one to do the second one. Uh, we would ideally be able to go out and be working on get, obtaining quotes and information on both of them at the same time because we would know we were, we're sort of doing both of them. So it's not waiting for this before you can then start working on the documentations and obtaining the quotes for given the dollar amount of the second one it, it, it is a much more rigorous procurement process that we would be going through so we wouldn't wait for one to start the other we could be working on the documentation to get the quotes and bids basically at the same is, time it's just is, one would happen before the other can I continue is yes. there any is there any reason to want to wait though I mean I'm just think I, I don't know the answer I'm thinking uh, maybe I guess maybe the Mr. Wobbins earlier point, uh, it, maybe there isn't as much sense of urgency with this one that this one could be done in April. I, I'm just thinking out loud uh, and focus on getting the enrollment study done now in, in, in November town meeting and then uh, having a, maybe a better snapshot of where the fine town finances are in April and do it then I just the, think. the original approach was that we the reason we brought it forth to the committee here to discuss it a our, our thought process was this was being as transparent as we could looking at the shifting needs no, I wasn't schools. suggesting non-transparency I was just thinking but uh, part of it was in order to because we knew we'd be getting asked sort of order of events what's happening that if we presented it as one process that all sort of goes hand in hand we could get it all moving at the same time in april we could it just then would really kick the process out further from being able to actually start the procurement process of it but it was really and we also looking at it depending who would be quoting on it you sort of might be able to get some economies of scale if it could be the same firm doing the work you might be able to get better pricing if you have people bidding on the entire thing Dr. Strati. if I can just add to that there are pieces of the planning study that can be done as the enrollment study is happening because as Joe was yeah, talking about a big piece of this is looking at your existing facilities but also the educational planning piece is taking a look at your existing programs and what a future program is going to look like um, so that can all be happening as the enrollment study is going on. <clears throat> I guess, can I? Yeah. I guess I'm just, again, I'm thinking out loud here with this. I'm thinking is, uh, is something, we're, we're basically going down two, diff, two tracks at the same time. I'm just thinking if we did the enrollment study, have time to uh, uh, debrief on that and look at that, and then uh, and not try and start and, and look at both of them at the same time I guess I'm just I, I, I think just one well one piece of that though that is, is completely separate is the building is the condition of the buildings yeah. and you know so that I think that piece of it is you know very ex as um, Mr. Hagen said pretty exhaustive work and we this is a direction we know we need to go in and that data is going to need to be collected and evaluated so um, you know, I think that there's, we know we are going to need to do something with buildings. Maybe one of the elementary school buildings, maybe more. And that we're not, we're going to need that piece um, regardless. I mean, well, in concert with, but we need that regardless of the um, enrollment study. So I don't know if. But I guess I was yeah. hearing the enrollment studies probably just good business practice that we do it every seven to ten years is that isn't that what we said so we would maybe considering doing that even if we weren't doing the second part of this right as running it as as running a good district I think given the the planning and development that's going on in the community this it would make sense to do and we haven't done one in several years it would make sense to do one right now yes but if I I, I guess I'm going to go out on a limb and say something. And <laughs> the if, if the windows and door piece didn't exist, we would be coming to you with one amount of money, which would include the enrollment study, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
we would be coming with that request. The reason why this is existing in two buckets is because of this window of door money. But normally, this would be all, we'd be requesting one amount of money, which the enrollment study would be a part of. If the enrollment study would be part of, Correct. in a way, the master Correct. planning study. The reason it's broken out it's is because, because money is coming from yes, a different Yes, we were place. trying to find a creative way of getting this additional mm -hmm. funding. Um, Mr. Bobbin. So, so a couple points. So first of all, I completely agree with several points different people have made. You know, the rigorous study before action, very important. We, need, we do need, I'm not opposed to an enrollment study again, I just was opposed to how we went about it, but I, I think it's appropriate to do an enrollment study from the sounds of it every 10 years. We just want to make sure we're getting good value for money and how we're doing it and when we're doing it. I have three concerns about this motion that we have on the floor right now, and I just want to lay them out. Um, the first is what percent, I want to understand if, what percent of our override additional capital that we're committing to this motion. So. 207,500 is not a very round number, very specific number. It's not 200. So let's just pick that one first. Do, do we have a sense of like this? Is this all of our money that we got from the override for capital over and above what we would otherwise have had? Mr. Lasher is indicating yes. This is it. This is everything. All right, so again, we are we got all of FY19 to spend this money, folks. We're going to write a check at the first school committee meeting we have a chance. We can't wait to write that check for $207,500 or commit to that. That's what the motion is. I want to be clear about that. I'm not saying that. And this may be the right thing to do. Nick, we're not writing a check. We're committing to authorize the fund, ask, ask for the funds to be authorized. We're, we're going to, to ask start. town meeting to authorize the movement of these funds. And if we don't do that, no check will be written. If, the, if town meeting decides that we haven't done our homework or we haven't been transparent or that we don't need to do a master planning study because there's not the there's no urgency around looking at our elementary schools and the condition and the program needs and all of this that we've been talking about if we decide it's important but town meeting decide it's not important then they won't then they won't support us they they will that's the check and balance they will not let us write the check but are so, we are we in agreement that this is all of them we're requesting all of the money be moved for this I believe purpose. Mr. La, Mr. Lala Shore at uh, came to us, uh, Bob can speak for himself, <laughs> putting this on the table after the meetings with the Is it 100% or not 100%? Yeah, yes, it is. And as I explained to town meeting on the floor after the override passed, um, this amount of capital is, is directed towards the Permanent Building Committee for Elementary School Space Study. Okay. And the only reason we're having this discussion tonight is the Permanent Building Committee declined to have that early discussion. They want to have a later discussion. Technically, since it says permanent building committee on the line of capital to be transparent, it seems like we should create a second line that doesn't say permanent building committee. It says elementary school space study. So but that is why the 207,500 was, if you will, added to their 150,000. So they now have 357,500. That was the express purpose um, of the motion on town meeting floor in April. Whether the town meeting or other people think that's the right way to use money today, I can't say, but that's what it was done for in April. And what would happen if we voted no on this motion to that money? It would sit there. Um, to be transparent, I would prefer that you don't spend what's called permanent building committee money for this purpose. It's a, it's a lawyer's question whether you would have the authority to do so. I think for transparency, I don't think John or I would be comfortable. So I just want to clarify what Mr. Lalasher said, that the Permanent Building Committee declined to, to um, execute this purpose. That's because the process that they have been developing over the last 18 months basically said, we agree that a master planning study needs to be done. We understand that that's what you know this money was, was put here for. However, af as we've developed our process, we feel that that type of study, that type of look at what is needed, the precursor to the building, to the design and the feasibility studies for building projects, that that's not where they start their process flow. And they asked us to push it back. So they specifically asked us to, to do this. Um, and I, I feel like we've, we keep, we've talked about space needs at least since I've been back on the committee since 2016. And again, we've had issues that relate to our inability to, to, our inability to utilize and have the agility of the space that we need for programmatic needs and to meet the needs of our students on a daily basis. And that's exactly what this is going to do. It's going to give us that full view. Can, can I put my second and third points on the floor? Yep. And I'll be done. I, also so, want, oh, I just yes. want to add something. Yeah. Um, 
in the broader picture, there's four sets of large capital projects, three large, maybe one not so large. Um, on the town side, we have already done this seed work, if you will, for human elder services for a new community slash um, senior center. We've, we've done this work, we've done the study, we've done some planning. We've also done work for the DPW garage in term, terms of rehabbing where it is. We know what that costs, we've done a study, We're, we've planned that. Um, the smaller set of costs is athletic slash recreation. And we've done a lot of work for what it costs, the different turf fields, lighting, and so on and so forth. You're the fourth piece. We're ready to go on most of the others. Um, if you're concerned about a community conversation about what should go next, that's not what's on the table here, I don't think. It's just you need to be prepared to come to that discussion. So this is this money would be what it's I, my only first point was just that this is 100 percent of the money that was allocated for this purpose. So of of the additional, on that. Everybody agrees the additional on that. And it was capital, initially yeah. allocated for this purpose. I totally agree. The 100 percent number was the only thing I was going after there. Mm -hmm. And then the second and third points, and I'll be yeah. glad to listen to everyone else. Um, just a timing concern, and maybe maybe Bob kind of touched on this here, was that I don't want to do a study because the money is available and be in a situation where we, we invest, we get a nice shiny binder, we get some new information, some new insights, and that years down the road, you know, we, we can't act on whatever those recommendations might be for whatever reason uh, as, as a community, as a committee, and then the report becomes out of date, and then we've spent all this money and we're not able to go do whatever the report recommends. Um, if, if it's in concert with other three other planning uh, initiatives within the community, and this is keeping in step with those other initiatives, to me that's an important thing to consider here. So. I, I just don't want to be out ahead of ourselves doing a big study in hopes that the money will be available in the future to spend a significant amount of taxpayer money and, and then only have it kind of sit on a shelf, get moldy, and then we say, oh, we've got to update it. It's been another $200,000 before we can build. Last point, the documentation here, um, I, I, for spending $200,000, I'd like to see more documentation in the packet or maybe a supplemental material so that a taxpayer can understand why a study, why an enrollment study costs $20,000, why a, a master plan study costs $200,000. Given what Mr. Huggins has said and, and, the, and the town manager tonight, that, that may be entirely kind of what these studies cost, but to somebody coming to it from the outside within our community, this is a lot of money for someone to look at. Uh, and, and to just see the school committee kind of sign off and say, well, 207,000, that's what they said, um, and go along with it without requiring some additional documentation for the public, for me, I, I think is a gap. Thank you. Mr. Bob, that's an allocation. It's not a, an actual spend. As Ms. Stout indicated, there's a, a rigorous quote process. So, uh, Ms. Stout, Dr. Knoxer. I just wanted to say that it was really important for me to hear about those three other projects because I see um, the town projects working in concert, to you use, use your word, and that that actually could save us money also. I mean, if this master plan will look at the senior center and early childhood and elementary schools at the same time, there might be ways to maximize the opportunities through capital plans to that will help everybody in town. And so I would strongly support this. So um, and that as Mrs. Webb has said, this is not new news for any of us. We've just passed an override. We have the money allocated for this. So to drag our feet um, when we've actually promised to do this work, I feel like it's important for us to take the step to do it. It might be the beginning of 2019, but it's not the beginning of this discussion. This discussion has been ongoing for a very long time. Ms. Sprowski, thank you. Um, I'm inclined to support this as well. I think, I've been thinking through the fact that the money has already been allocated in a very public way for this purpose, the only reason I can think of to no longer support it is like with the doors. If there was a change in circumstances and we said, you know what, we've looked at our buildings and we think we've got good space, we're good. We're covered for the next 10 to 20 years. When as we've ad nauseum covered, we're not. We've got modulars that won't last forever. We have full day kindergarten, we have rise, we have special education programs. We have all of these things that we've been talking about as you said, for years that aren't going away. So we know the need hasn't changed. The money's been allocated for this purpose. Um, so I'm inclined to support it. Mrs. Van Den Ecker. Thanks. So um, I, I guess I'm a little bit between um, my colleagues here. So 
depending on what the enrollment study says, couldn't that actually change the parameters of what we'd ask for in the master plan study? Like, for instance, what if it came back and said, you actually aren't, you have like this kindergarten bubble now, but now you're not really gonna have a lot more elementary kids coming in. Or, um, I don't know, for example, so I do wonder if there is some wisdom to getting the enrollment study first and then crafting the master plan procurement and parameters and specifics based on that data. I think Dr. Darty. So I'll try to go in as much detail as I can yep. without Thanks. writing an educational plan for you. Right. Okay. But this is the type of things that are going to be in a study. Enrollment is inter. Wine, yeah. integrated as part of it, which is why coming to you with asking for two requests, normally we'd be coming to you with one request and enrollment is just a piece of this study. Right. So I think we need to look at it that way. So one of the things, and Mr. Huggins already touched upon some of these things. So in an elementary planning study, a master plan, what you're going to be taking a look at is the existing condition of your, of your five schools, including the modulars. You're going to look at both the exterior and the interior, your systems, your infrastructure. Is it handicap accessible? Is it not handicap accessible? All of, all of those things, your technology infrastructure, it really takes a look at everything in your buildings. So that's one piece. The next thing it takes a look at is how does the operations work in your building from an educational standpoint. So do you have a school psychologist? Do you have a school nurse? Do you have uh, a building principal? Do you have an assistant principal? All of those things. Do you have a team chair? And what are their functions? Because that determines also space because all of those positions and how they work with other people are a big part of that. It also takes a look at the educational vision. So what, what are our elementary schools going to look like in 10 years? What are the programmatic needs? Um, how does that tie into what is going on at the state level right now? So it takes a look at the educational vision. Enrollment projections are, are integrated as part of that um, educational planning. So you take a look at the program and the enrollment changes, if there are any, and that is going to determine some other things. Um, which then takes a look at options. So, in a, you know, to put, to put it out on the table, this is the first step in looking at what are we going to do with Killam. Mm -hmm. It really is, because logically, Killam could be a solution for some of the needs that, that we have at our, ele at our elementary level. So you take a look at Killam and you say, okay, Killam has some ADA issues, it has systems issues, it has window um, and other infrastructure issues. As a, as, a, as a building, it's very sound. But can you build onto a second floor for Killam if we need additional space? Do we build out? Purposely, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, the reason why we haven't done any field work is because we don't know yet what the next steps are going to be for Killam. Um, there was a field project that was supposed to happen um, a couple years ago and it was put on hold for this very reason. So when an elementary planning study is going to take a look at are all of those things and how do we move forward with finding the best educational needs for our programs and any enrollment changes that are anticipated from an enrollment study. I just want to make sure, Dr. Doherty referred to the five buildings, but we are talking, talking rise and Oh, and the preschool. I'm also. sorry. I, yep. Yes. Thank oh, you. Oh, okay. So, um, I'm sorry. Am I still on? Yeah, floor? go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry if I'm not. Okay. So, but I guess where I'm getting stuck a little bit um, is, let's say that the enrollment study said, gee, your, your enrollment's going to actually go down 500 kids. I think the, the point there is the study is that's part of it and when yeah. you look at all of the buildings and it says it's going to go down by 500 students where is it going to go down what does that mean well if it's going to go down by 500 students and that's primarily going to be in the north end of town yeah. then that might change what you do with Kilman. it might say you need to do we need to take a harder look at Joshua Eaton again or something so it's it whether it's up or down it's it doesn't matter what, but the data will be incorporated because it's part of the overall master planning study and it has to be incorporated. So I think that the point is that that's, it, it's integral. And I, I believe that, you know, in hearing from um, Mr. Lalashur, that was the intention all along. It was just 
perhaps at our town meeting, um, we didn't sort of have the forethought to put it in a separate category, and the money for this purpose got put in the Permanent Building Committee, and they have told us unequivocally, that's not our role. You, need, you guys need to go do this master planning study, do this work, get it done, and then come back to us, and we'll put you through our rigorous process um, before you do anything to the buildings. Okay. So I'm sorry, may I just finish my one yeah. last clarifying yeah. question? So in other words, let's say that theoretically the study came back and said your enrollment's gonna go down 500 elementary kids, we think, in the next three years. Would we still actually need a master plan study anyway? Yes. Because then we'd have to figure out where those kids would be and where the programs would be and which school would stay online or go online yes. or something else. Yes. Okay. So can I just clarify? Yeah, right. I think that was part mm -hmm. directed. My, my point was the enrollment study, I mean, that, that would set the baseline set the baseline for how you write your RFP for right. the master plan. Is that what? That was so my first question, yeah. If, yeah. if enrollment comes back that it's down 500 and it's whatever, uh, we would craft our RFP for the master plan based on Definitely. that. That's why I was yeah. saying, oh, no. should we wait for the enrollment no, study? No, the, the, the results of the enrollment study are not going to determine what type of RFP you're going to get because you need the enrollment data as part of your whole elementary plan. It's not going to determine the scope of the, of the master study. It's a piece of data that's going to be used But doesn't with the it master become study. part of the RFP that goes out for the master plan? Don't they want to know what the enrollment is? No. The, they, no, they, no, no. This is most likely going to go all to bid all at the same time. Wouldn't they be more apt to just know that they're going to have a up-to-date that in a, the enrollment study is being done and that if you're doing your master planning and you're bidding on this master plan, one of the questions would be, well, when was the enrollment study last done? What kind of data is that going to be? How rich is that data going to be? And if I was quoting, giving a quote, then if the answer came back and said that's going to be done, that's being done right now, and this is the scope of that study, then I can go ahead and develop what's my proposal for the master plan versus if the district came back and said, well, we really are not going to do that and you'll just have to use the data from 2001. That would be I, I different. think there's some confusion here, and, and I apologize if I've explained this incorrectly. The enrollment study is a piece of data that is used in conjunction with the entire elementary planning. You don't do that first and then you do the second piece. You go out to bid with a whole package, which part of it, it's because it's an architectural firm that usually does this work, that, that specializes in, in these areas, in educational planning. So as part of the educational plan, there is an enrollment study. The only reason why tonight it's a little confusing is because we had this other pool of money that we were trying to creatively find a way to get a number that would allow us to do both. Mr. Bob. Yeah, so just one quick point and then a question. Um, the quick point is, if 207,500 was 100% of what was allocated to us, would, is, would it have been 227,500 if we had put them together? Yes. Yes. So that would have been more than 100% of what we were allocated? In the override, the, so which we would is have why spent we some of our FY19 money the, in addition to override FY19 which money. Upon completion of all of the summer work and everything that um, Mr. Huggins discussed, we, in all of these meetings and discussions we've had, that's where we said we do have the ability to ask for a repurposing or a shifting of the funds that were already allocated in the capital plan. So we, we wanted to be as transparent as possible to say the ask is the 227, but 20 of it exists within the schools. We're just looking to repurpose it based upon the completion of all of the summer work and we've had all of the mandated inspections. So we are very comfortable that for those two specific buildings, that that money, if it were to be used, it most likely would have come up during all of the work that was done over the summer. Well, I think you couldn't be more transparent than a roll call vote in public, so thank you for that. Um, second question, and this is a very important fact, and Dr. Dox brought this up, and, and I heard uh, the town manager say this. 
My understanding from the, those two sets of comments is that this is actually one of four master plans in our town. Is that, am I understanding that right? And that if we didn't approve this, then we would have three out of four master plans done. And it, 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 in your point, we wouldn't have a seat at the table with the analogy you drew. But maybe you can ex explain the other projects that are going on in the town and how if we vote for this motion, that will help coordinate efforts between these four master plans. Yeah, what, how do they work together? I don't, I don't know that I understand the school part and the school process well enough to compare the two. Well, just, um, just I don't take, know if you, well, if you do this piece, I don't know if there's something else before you actually would design a building. Um, so I'll say on the town side, um, we've done the, um, I guess I'll call it the enrollment study for seniors. Uh -huh. So we have projections of how many seniors will live in town. Um, since the locker study was done, our population is up almost 10%. I don't have any idea how many of that is, is school kids. I know there's a lot of seniors. That's the fastest growing segment. Um, we have an idea of what kind of program space we need for seniors, although we haven't done it in depth. It's not nearly as complex as a school um, system would be. Um, so we know roughly how much space we need. Um, we're working on a couple of creative possibilities, but that's, that's a long way off from actually having a project. But we've done the basic work. For DPW, we've done the same. We have an inventory of the people, of the equipment. We know the square footage requirements for new space. Um, we have a per square foot co construction cost. We know what it would cost to fix the current DPW garage. Um, we're trying to find some creative solutions not to do that and to share costs with one or two other communities. So we've done a base level of work on that. Um, there may be some additional work needed, but we've done all the, again, equipment assessment, programmatic needs, if you will. We know all that. Um, the recreation and athletic capital is a little different. There seems to be an insatiable, uh, infinite demand for field space, so I don't think we can solve that. Um, we did a thorough study of uh, lighting five fields on Birch Meadow. I had to cancel the project because the bids came in too high. We have really good up-to-date estimates for the turf field, um, for the uh, gym floor, the bleachers, for related recreational and athletic uh, capital. Um, I don't think in that case we've done any kind of projection of, uh, you know, will there be this much growth in athletic users? We just know we don't have enough right now. Um, the selectmen have discussed uh, at their last meeting and as, have, as one of the uh, ten goals for them that they're looking at is uh, recreational space in town. Should, should we really take a serious look at that? And, and the answer is we'll see. So, you know, it, it doesn't exactly compare to what you folks look at, but we have done a lot of preliminary work. Um, and we've also, it's not related to this discussion, but the building security study is probably in the best shape. Mm -hmm. um, we are ready to go tomorrow if we got a dollar. Um, so that one's ready to go, shovel ready, as they say. And the other three on the town side, combined with athletics and recreation schools, is close to being ready to go. The question is, how comfortable do you feel um, in you know, your situation? And then this has nothing to do with a discussion of community priorities. Most of what I'm talking about is not affordable inside the tax levy. Some of the athletic and recreation issues, one at a time, are. Anything over five million, FinCom has just voted a policy in August. You go to the voters. We suggest you go to the voters over five million. So again, if you're gonna go through the permanent building committee, which we are theoretically ready to do, we're very close. The question is, you know, how, it's, it's not, you're not deciding the order of priorities for the community tonight. You're just arming yourself with the ability to be at the table for that full discussion, I think. Thank you. And, and for me, that's an extremely important piece of information in how I view this request, because I think we are one reading ultimately, even though the schools handle one piece of the reading budget for the schools. You know, I, I think we need to play well with others and with all the, all the other uh, efforts that are going on in the town. So you know, ba based on an effort to coordinate and have the schools ready to have a discussion about resources that is synchronized with that of the town, I can now support this. Thank you. Is there any uh, further discussion? I have a question. May I ask one more? Yeah. I'm sorry. So, um, just when you're talking about the stu the study, um, looking at programmatic needs and so forth, did they also make recommendations? Like yes, your, they do. Your district 
should consider expanding this program or this they um, might not be assessing the quality of individual programs though or something like what kinds of recommendations might they make for example? so they're going to make recommendations on how to address the space needs with your existing well, but they wouldn't necessarily make this, um, recommendations you, about this is the type of program your district needs. When you're, no, that, that's more of an educational yeah, exactly. decision, yeah, yeah. not a. No, okay. Right. Thank you. Dr. Doxer. Um, just sort of connected with that. They would be thinking, though, about the upcoming needs in terms of full day kindergarten growing, in terms of yes. lots that's, of different that's considerations. That's a programmatic, yes. That's a programmatic, yes. Okay, though we have a, um, Mr. Bobbin and then Ms. I, I still would love more documentation, at least commensurate with whatever we've provided to taxpayers on the town side. So if, if at some point, I'm, I will support the motion. I would like when we get into the bidding process that whatever documentation is provided to taxpayers for that process on the town side, to the extent that it makes sense on the school side to have comparable documentation. And I don't know if that's a lot of paper or very little paper. I just want the taxpayer to have the same insight into this assessment that we're voting on that they would to any taxpayer funded assessment on the town side. So if, if and I know you work together very closely, Dr. Darty, with the town manager. So if you could just make that an agenda item when you talk, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Downing and then Mr. Berman. Thank you for the discussion. I've, I've, a lot of my questions have been answered, but there was the, still the question that I alluded to earlier, and I, now I'm even more confused. Is all 207,000 school buildings only? Like, what other buildings are, are you going to look at other than the schools? The ask is for school buildings. It's an elementary study. So, so it's only, oh, so it is only elementary, all these other, the pre, other stuff? Pre-K, pre pre-K pre -K through pre elementary, yeah. okay. master planning. Because just, I was reminded of something when um, Mr. Bobbin was talking about, you know, doing a study and then having it become outdated. Um, when we think back to the Locker Report and the, the studies were there, if you recall around June 2013, when you were looking at St. Agnes, you know, there was, a consultant, I think it's Scott Dunlop, the same one who did the high school that you employed to come up with the design for that, a traffic study, then there was they weren't part the designer. of one. That wasn't the, excuse me, that wasn't the designer, they were the, um, that was the OPM. Right, but you architect. spent, you spent, um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it must have been at least 100,000 in playing those, how much was it? It was 10,000. 10,000? Yeah, that's all it was. All of it was a very surfacey look at St. Agnes. Even, even that, even, even the high school stuff that you? No, 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 we're talking about just St. Agnes. No, but I'm just saying that whole early childhood center, I'm sorry, I'm flowing St. Agnes into, before you asked town meeting for the 485,000, you had, there was some preliminary amount of money you gave I thought we gave somebody to to look at the high school before we got a design, right? No. Did, are you talking no. about the high You're school? You're talking about the early, she's the, talking the, about the, the, the early, early childhood, childhood working group. What, early That's childhood working, working group, group, which right. I'm not sure that, what year that I know when that was. You know, I just want to say that that was an example of it, it maybe maybe it was less money than you think, but it was something that we spent money on that sat on the shelf. And I agree with Mr. Bobbin that if we get something now and can move forward, I, I don't. It didn't sit on the shelf. I, I believe that the working group did a tremendous amount of work, and in the end, the, I came to the committee. I believe I was on the committee at the time, where I was on the working group, and there was the solutions were not feasible. We could not move forward. Right. So I don't, I don't see that. I think that that was put to good use, it, and it, it certainly does show that, yes, this is an issue that we have been working to address for a long time. The more recent implementation of the modulars was certainly um, something that we, that we made a decision to do um, because at that time, you're right, at that time we didn't take a more, um, say, building-based permanent, we didn't build a new facility in this parking lot or we didn't uh, recreate the Wilburn Street School at St. Agnes, so we did the modulars. Dr. Darty, did you? No, I just wanted, town meeting voted down the request for it was about five hundred thousand dollars for a feasibility study for another right, town. Right, right. That was so in, that was based on all the work that we had been doing over the few years prior to that. 
which included the locker report, which included uh, the work that Scott, AI3. that AI3 did on Woburn Street, because we were trying to present to the community options. Right. Um, that potentially with additional funds could be studied deeper. But the amount of funding for Woburn Street was about $10,000. And it really, all it did was a surfacey look at what what we could do with St. Agnes, and there was a traffic study done, yes, as part of that. Right, no, because the working group came after town meeting. Because the working group was formed in fall of 2014, according the to... The working group was like three years long, right, that yeah, I remember. Yeah. There was well, at least... Was, okay. <laughs> Anyway, so so the answer is though that all 207k is is elementary buildings. Elementary school planning pre-K pre to elementary. All right, thanks, Mr. Berman. Barry Berman, member of the select board, talking as a member of the select board, but not for the select board. Just uh, want to be okay. really clear. Um, <laughs> congratulations, Mrs. Webb, on your Thank election you. to chair, and welcome, Christine. I, I don't know if this is your first meeting. So, a couple of things that um, kind of uh, jump out at me, just from sort of lessons learned um, during the override process. Um, one was um, when the selectmen, at that time we were the selectmen, did the survey. Um, where we actually ask people, how, why would you vote for an override? In what way would you vote for an override? One of the most compelling things that just came out, jumped out on survey after survey was, tell me what we need up front. Tell me everything that you're going to ask me for. Don't ask me for the library now and the override later and kill them down the road. Tell me everything up front. Right? And then we'll decide, as a community, what we can afford, what we're willing to go into our pockets for, and what we're going to pay for. That was a compelling piece of information that I think we all learned from. The second piece, um, with takeaway really from the override, um, was that um, the select board and staff, the school committee and staff, did their homework separately, talked about what we needed, um, what resources we have, what resources we need to get what we need, and then work together collectively to create a piece of information to go out to the community and said, this is how, this is, this is why we're asking you to do what we do. And the, and the community overwhelmingly supported that effort. We worked together really well. I think what, what this study is um, really important for, and I'm really glad you're calling it a um, elementary school study as opposed to let's fix kill them, right? Everybody knows we need to fix kill them, but if you just looked at kill them, you might be looking at, and we're spending $200,000, looking at some of the lost opportunities that could actually prevail by doing a study on enrollment and then finding out that, well, maybe it's going to be that. You, you might find out that, well, we don't need a new building. We can maybe repurpose one or two. Combine that with some of the stuff that, we've, that we know on the town side, we're a little bit of ahead. We know about the senior center. The senior center, it just it does not work. Maybe there's some ways to combine kinds of things. There's other resources that we have right now that could be brought to bear. For example, there's Oakland Road. The select board now has been given the authority to, to, to have a dispo, you know, to figure out Oakland Road. Does that work, right? So I think that getting A, tell, finding out what we need, telling the voter, this is what's going to come at you. We're not sure of the order. We're not sure of the magnitude. We're not sure of priorities, but this is all of it. We're going to study it together, right? And then we're going to come up with solutions. And you know we're going to do the best that we can to basically fund what we can. And if we don't have enough, we're going to ask you for more. But here's the reason why we need it, and we've done our homework. So I think that those lessons that we learned, combined with what you're trying to do right now, I think is important because that will close the loop in terms of what we know we're going to need for capital. There's always going to be stuff that comes down the road, stuff that breaks. But these are the major capital things. We all know about them. Um, and then this piece is really. Um, uh, but really the final piece, and, and what I really hope is, is that, you know, you guys 
work with us and think outside the box a little bit, right? Let's not work in the silos. Like, oh, we, need to fix, we need to do a senior center, so we're just gonna do the senior center. You guys need to do schools. Let's figure out stuff that we can do together and maybe there's creative solutions because we can't afford to do it all. We can't afford to do it all at once, but we can't afford not to be creative in looking at mm -hmm. some of those potential solutions. And I think part of the way we're gonna get there is for, for at least this study to happen because um, yes, we have to fix Killam, but you don't know what you don't know yet, right? You don't know what that study is gonna bring, and you don't know what the opportunities that are gonna be able to be uncovered from that, and then let's all work together like we have in the past and get it done, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Uh, Mr. Bobbin. I'd like to propose an amendment to the motion. Um, Mr. Bobbin. May I? Yes. 25 words. So it, at the end of the motion, if they, perhaps could Dr. Dobson read the motion again and then I'll um, just read the phrase yeah. I was going to add at the end of it. It just goes on at the end. Okay. Move to request additional funding to perform an elementary master plan study in the amount of $207,500. Comma. And provide the public with supporting documentation commensurate with other comparable Reading master planning projects in consultation with the office of the town manager. So the intent here in my mind is to document our commitment to provide the public with the same level of transparency and documentation in this process that they would get elsewhere. No more, no less, just exactly the same so the taxpayer and the member of the public is getting the same uh, insight into all of these processes. Uh, Mr. Boylan. Yes. Um, I just need the last part of that. I have comma and provide the public with supporting documentation commensurate with other Reading building projects in conjunction with the office, the office of the town manager. manager. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is there a second? Uh, Mrs. Brown. No, I had a question, but I'll wait for a second. Uh, is there a second? Second. Mr. Robinson. I'm a little bit, and it may be because I only heard it, but are you asking for supporting document for the cost of the study or supporting? I, I don't know what you mean by supporting materials. Whatever the, so it's entirely flexible. It's, it's whatever the taxpayer can see with respect to these other master plans when they see it. So could You're I, talking about the master plan itself. Yes. Okay, I misunderstood. Okay. And, well, I misunderstood the, the process. No, okay. I, I mean, what I'm referring to in the motion is this is a motion to authorize, not a motion to <clears throat> describe the contents of the work product of this. This is a motion to authorize the funds for, or recommend to town meeting to authorize funds to, to be used for yeah. bidding for a... Can I, can I ask? For, I'd so like, can I answer the question? Can, can I? I'd like to have Mr. Huggins yes. help answer this okay. or clarify. But I think, sorry, it was a question about what I was asking about. I just wanted to answer Jean's question. Okay. And then I'm happy to yield the floor and receive more information. Okay. My thinking is, my intent here is just that in, in the process of, let's say we vote yes to this. Let's say town meeting votes yes. I just want something in writing that, from this committee that says that the documentation, the level of whatever documents are available to the public for those other master plans within Reading that we're providing in this study, no more, no less than what they would have elsewhere. So it's not, it's doing nothing more than saying Dr. Darty and the town manager are gonna to talk to each other and just say, hey, how are you doing? How did you roll this out? What documents did you post when? What did you put in meeting packets? Have a comparable level of specificity. That's what I'm asking. Thanks for Thank that you. clarification. We have no reason to know now whether this is not already more. Right. Right? Mr. Lalish. No, we don't. So, and, and all I'm asking is for Dr. Darty and the town manager no. to talk and make sure that, that there's a written commitment that. I, because all of the other pro master plans are being managed by the town side. This is coming out of the school side. I want to make sure that we're Mr. providing a comparable experience for the taxpayer on both sides. Director stops. Huggins is directly involved with us on this, uh, with Ms. Dowd. I, I do, I'd like to hear uh, Mr. Lullisher just sort of give us a little. Just, just so you're comfortable with the way procurement works in the town, 
um, by luck, I'm the chief procurement officer. This is all my fault. Anything that's more than 25,000 comes to me. Um, we have a procurement officer in town hall. Everything that you do that's more than 25,000 goes through the procurement officer. Um, all the documentation are public documents. Their bid documents are all public. So effectively, I think we have a process by law that will do all the things that you want. Um, you know, we have differing needs for some of our projects, some more extensive, some less. I think perhaps some, some fault would be drawn with the way the library process was run because there was not a lot of this up front in terms of estimating a need. There was just a stated need. Um, but anything that uh, the facilities department for the schools will do will go through the town manager's office by law. So I think um, I, I don't believe that that amendment is really necessary to achieve the goal. Um, and I, I do feel like I, I just sort of want to make sure that there's no implication here that um, Dr. Darty and his staff have done anything less. I find that our level of transparency is paramount. I consistently hear from our uh, school committee field director that our district and our committee provide more information than almost any other district across the state. So I I would, I don't see the need for this. I think Mr. Lalashur has just demonstrated that it's, it's already part of the process because the documents are public documents. They go through the town. So. Mr. Borowski, thank you. Um, I am generally supportive of as much collaboration and consistency across the two sides as possible, so I philosophically am on board. Um, but I am concerned about this particular language, partly because of the exact flexibility you mentioned. It could be read in a number of different ways, and I'm afraid that people could put their own you know, interpretation of what the same means. It should look like this. And one immediate concern that jumped to mind is I'm assuming that the kind of consultant or company we would work with would specialize in school districts. And so might present something that does look in some ways different than a space study on a senior center. And if we approve this language, a member of the public could reasonably say, well, you know, the space study on the senior center had X, Y, and Z in it, and the school committee said that this study should be the same as that, so why did you not have it? Well, it's not applicable to a school district. I think it's a little bit apples and oranges. I would be a little bit afraid of that. Is there further discussion? Can you, just, can you read that again? I'm sorry. Read <laughs> yes. that amendment again. Do you want me to read the whole? No, read no, just, just the, the amendment. amendment. So, and provide the public with supporting documentation commensurate with other Reading building projects in conjunction with the office of the town manager. So, Mr. Robinson. So I, I think the town manager I think you've just said that we have to do that by law, so uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't think the amendment's necessary because it's something, it's part of the process we've, we're already doing, so. right? Isn't that what you? Yeah. I also just want to say that I think this is what we have done. I'm very grateful for how explicit Mr. Huggins and, and um, Dr. Darty and Ms. Dowd have been about what our financial needs are and how they're applied and unpackaging it for the public and the willingness to answer any questions that come up. So I share Ms. Borowski's concern about the interpretation of, of the language and don't see this amendment as necessary at all. It will happen. It does happen. Okay, is there any further discussion on the amendment? Um, then we need to take a vote on the amendment. All those in favor? All those opposed? And the motion does not carry. It's five to one. The amendment. The, sorry, the amendment does not carry. The main motion, Mrs. Doxer, can you read the main motion again? Dr. Doxer. Yes. Sorry. Move to request additional funding to perform an elementary master plan study in the amount of $207,500. And that was seconded already. Um, so if there's no further discussion, we'll take a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And the motion carries 6-0. Okay, so I would like to uh, thank Mr. Lila Schur and uh, Mr. Huggins. Are there any? May I say one yep. thing before? Uh, 
Joe, well, maybe Joe is staying for the, the rest of it. I don't know. But I, I just want to I want to take a moment and I want to thank. Um, and I, I should have done this at the beginning when Joe first started talking about the the update on the facilities. I, I want to thank the work that Joe Huggins, the facilities department, does for the schools. I know he does also a lot for the town, but I'll focus on the schools. Um, we have a very collaborative relationship with the, the core facilities department. They do an amazing job with four facilities, maintenance workers, um, that work in 17 buildings total. Um, and the amount of work that they did this summer in the schools, you saw the list, but there were some other things that happened that didn't reach the scope that was on the list, but was just as important. You know, something simple as a major move that occurred with our offices this summer, um, which was happening uh, just as the fiscal year was um, closing. So there was a lot happening. So I just want to publicly thank Joe for his leadership, uh, for everything that he does for the school buildings. I've known Joe for close to 10, 10 years you've been here? 14 years, okay, 14 years I've known Joe, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but I just want to thank him for the work, the work that he does for, for the Reading Public Schools. Thank you. All right, we'll, um, we're gonna quickly shift back to, um, actually I want to shift back to the consent agenda. I just am sort of getting nervous that we're gonna forget that. So uh, we'll go back to the consent agenda and then we'll um, move through old business, new business, and reports, and um, then public input. So let's do the consent agenda. Um, Mrs. Browski. Can I pull the August 8th minutes from the consent agenda? Yes, Thank so Ms. Browski would like the August 8th minutes from the consent agenda. And we have a motion Second. seconded. So motion to approve. Move to approve the consent agenda. As amended. As amended, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's second. it. Second, Mr. Bobbin, thank you. All those in favor? 6 0. Okay, good. Um, I think we'll go, uh, I, we, we can go into the second reading of the policies, or if people want to hear. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm just curious why, we're, why we pulled them. I'd actually, I'd like to pull. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I want to propose two changes, and then I think we can vote to pass it. If okay, committee. sorry. Is that okay? Yep. Um, so um, the August 8th minutes, there was one paragraph, and I apologize for putting the committee through this, uh, on the, it says page six. And it's middle of the page, right above an underlined section that says Director of Student Services. It's a paragraph that begins, Mrs. Brasky reported a workshop hosted by William James College and Teachers 21 on social emotional learning. That entire paragraph, actually, we've already approved in separate meeting, uh, minutes from a separate meeting. That was earlier. So I just would, would like to ask that we remove that paragraph. Uh huh. This is the, that paragraph. Yeah. And then my second amendment, and one, it might be easier to do them as two separate amendments because I guess people could agree with one and not yeah. the other. So let's. Um, just we'll yeah. take a, a motion to strike the paragraph um, on page six that starts with Ms. Borowski and ends with initiatives discussed already in place. So moved. Okay, all those in favor? Uh, Thank you. Five zero. What's that? Thank you. Um, and there was one more earlier in the minutes on page four. Um, there's a whole section, additional information for packet from Eric McNamara. Um, it starts with that, and it goes right through middle of page five, um, I guess right above the line, upcoming ARCASA annual meeting. I'm a little bit concerned. My memory is that none of this was actually read or discussed in the meeting. And I, I think the minutes need to reflect discussion that actually happened in the meeting. But it could be my bad memory, so my apologies if it's bad memory. Can I refine that? Uh, Ms. Dr. Dr. So during the meeting, I said that I was also including other information from the director, Erica McNamara, that I would not take the time to read, but I would submit to be a part of the minutes. So I said that during it, rather than take more time I think that to read it as well. 
think that while well, Ms. Sprouse gets speak, I think one of the issues is that it gets in the minutes of the packet without the committee members then having had an opportunity to um, right. review it. it. It really gets down to what the minutes are for. I think the minutes are supposed to reflect what we discussed in the meeting and not, <coughs> and I have other stuff I'm not going to discuss in the meeting, but I'll put it in the minutes. And, and I think this is really important information, so please, absolutely very important information. I think it maybe just belongs in a memo in the packet. Not in, under information. Under inf other, information, other information, additional information, or something like that. I'm just a little bit concerned. I don't recall the time that we've passed minutes that include information that wasn't discussed by the committee. And that's a different precedent. Mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. sure we should be doing that. But I wanted to raise it as a concern. So that in the future, that this this information could be moved to or put in a memo as this was additional information, additional information. provided by a liaison or, right. or, or anyone, anyone in the committee. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bobbin. I think Ms. Barosky raises a really good point. I agree. Thank you. I hadn't thought about that. That's a really good point. Did, did that get seconded? To do, would you second that? that? Second. No, to, um, no, to remove it from the minutes. Is that, that was your? That was my motion, was to remove that chunk from the minutes. Right. Okay. Jean, would you consider a friendly amendment Absolutely. to include it as an agenda? In a different way. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. You could put it under additional information. Yeah, it, it, it's standard mm -hmm. practice to submit something with the meeting record. I mean, it happens at town meeting all yeah. the time. Uh, so it just shouldn't get weaved into the minutes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. It should be a, a, you know, an addendum to that yep. meeting. Exactly. So friendly amendment. Yep. Carries. Friendly amendment. So. so to to remove the paragraph from the meeting, the identified paragraph from the meeting minutes, um, but then they can be placed in a um, additional information memo. In the packet. In the packet, right. <coughs> All under additional information. What's the heading? Um, I believe we said it was additional information, supplemental information. We, I think we can have. Um, Mrs. Langelson, I think it's, uh, and you can go on to uh, G, information slash correspondence. Right. In the, in the packet. In the packet. Oh, sorry. We would move under section G, information and correspondence. Okay. All those in favor? The the, uh, well, the amendment was friendly, so all no, those. No, no. So the motion. Okay, I have the motion. Yep. Yeah. All those in favor? Thank you. Okay. And five, five. All five those. All one. Just because I wasn't present, so okay. I'm abstaining. I'm I know. Okay. All. all right. Uh, okay, sir. All right. Um, now I guess we should move to the second reading of the policies. Policy, right. So we have, um, say, Dr. Doctor, do you want to? Let's start by putting those uh, motions on the table. So you want to put that motion on the table. Move to accept the second reading of revised policy JICH, alcohol, tobacco, and drug use by students prohibited. Second. Second. Okay. Okay. So we did the first reading. I can't remember when. July, I think. And August. August. This was August, August 8th. 8th. Oh, yeah. Our July meeting was August 8th. Do we actually have to start reading and dispense with it? You, you do, yes. You don't have to spend a lot of time reading. Okay. So I'll just start. The Reading Public Schools seeks a drug free environment for its students and staff. To that end, Reading Public Schools offers Special, Mr. I'd like to move to uh, suspend the further reading. All those in favor? Okay. Um, so is there, do we have any discussion? So I just, just want to add, uh, just, uh, there's been a couple of changes that I've made since the last. Um, okay, great. If you could review that. Sure. So I've added since August 8th, um, the introductory paragraph has been placed in there. I, I did get a lot of feedback, I should back up, I did get a lot of feedback from school committee members on both policies. Um, so I've incorporated the feedback into 
the, ch the changes since August 8th. So um, essentially it's what's in, you have color copies of the packet. Yeah, so, so the it's blue. What's in blue. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the first pack, that whole first paragraph, which was in the original policy, but was taken out because this was an MASC policy. So um, by putting the introduction back in, it does explain the purpose of it. Uh, the other piece that was that was brought up was to clarify um, the steroid piece um, in the marijuana piece. So to reflect that these are illegal substances that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what the, it's in the second paragraph in blue. Um, the Good Samaritan Law, we put the actual Good Samaritan Law in there in blue. Um, and then the expert piece, which is that next paragraph, um, it really should be grade six through 12, which gives us more latitude instead of grade seven and nine. Mm -hmm. So. Um, oh, great. Mm -hmm. Currently, we do it in grades 9 and 11. Uh, and we find that those two grades are uh, working very well um, in using the ESPER uh, <clears throat> process. So that, I, oh, the last piece is I cross-referenced um, JLCD um, because there is a policy that you already have on administrating, administering medication to students. So what we're talking about here is illegal substances for youth, not substance, not medication that students would bring to school each day. Are there any so questions? So those are the changes since uh, that, August. Ms. Brass, can I you? assume all these revisions have gone through legal review? No, they've not gone through legal review because originally MAC was the one that developed right. the policy. Well, and the others were, is there anything that was? Well, the first paragraph was already our the other policy. policy. I just put it back in. Okay. And the, I'm just clarifying any other pieces. The, the paragraph um, about the, sorry, the um, immunity, that's from the law. That's, that's, that's the Good Samaritan state law. law. That's the actual Good Samaritan law. I see Mr. Blavin got that one. Which actually was in the MASC policy. Okay. So um, I, I want to just thank the committee members. I know that several <clears> of you <throat> gave a lot of great input and feedback and thoroughly read this, and um, that's our obligation. I appreciate it. Mrs. Thank Vandenecker. You. Yeah, uh, so my apologies since I missed the last meeting. I did, of course, read this in preparation for tonight. And did I miss it? But um, do we want to have anything in there that talks about something like misuse of prescribed medications? So behind this policy, yeah. there is a set of regulations. Mm -hmm. the implement, it's, it's actually the chemical health regulations. Yeah. So that explains in much more detail. Um, that's in the handbook, which yeah. was approved on August 8th. Um, so all of that is in the in those regulations. In yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, any other comment? Uh, Mr. Bobbin? Wouldn't those substances be controlled substances? So if someone had a prescription medication, that's a controlled substance? It's a small c, small s. Mm -hmm. That's how I understood this policy. It's a, it's a the red phrase, first full paragraph after the bullet points. But yeah, are you, are you saying that, that that needs to be capitalized? No, no, oh, I, sorry. I understood the small c as to be more generic to include not just you know, your illegal drugs, but also oh. drugs that are legal if prescribed, yes. illegal if not properly administered. Oh, correct. Right. That's how I understood the correct. Policy. Oh, so thank my you. My understanding is that it's covered. Correct. Thank you, yes. and, thank and you. I will say Dr. Darty is really, really thorough in, in talking to you know, us about you know, making sure he got input from everybody, so I appreciated that collaboration. May I ask one more question? Yep. The expert process by law is they mandate it's just in one grade and uh, no two grades grades six through two twelve. Grades? Okay, I we, I it's mandated now in two grades. The oh, pilot, is. the first year you could pilot it in just one grade, okay. and then you had to do it in two grades after that. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion on policy JICH. And that vote is six to zero. All in favor. Okay, Mrs. Doxer, Dr. Doxer, another policy. Another motion. Policy EBC, move to accept the second reading of revised policy EBC, school safety. 
this time. Thank you, Mr. Bobbin. Go ahead, start. Oh, okay. he said Mr. Bobbin was going. Oh, he do seconded it. it. Oh, sorry. Emergency plans. The Reading School Committee and the members of the school department are committed to providing a safe, orderly, and productive. Dr. Dr. Yes. Motion that we discontinue with further reading. Second. And, and all in favor? Six zero. Um, Dr. Darty, any? Um, there was a couple of changes um, that we made in this one. Um, one change in the middle of the second page. Um, originally, I just had in there Alice, and as we know, the, the um, technology has been changing a lot with active shooter drills and the research that's been out there. So I made it more generic, but I did put in parentheses as an example, Alice. Um, so active shooter drills could, could look different in the future. Right now it's Alice, it could be something else in the future. Um, there was one other change, I can't remember what it was. Um, it was the four fire drills. Oh yes, thank you, thank you very much. The four fire drills are required by law. So I made that clarification as well in the first page. Um, where are the drills? The drills. Maybe it's on the second page. It's the third paragraph on the second page. Second page, thank you. Yep. Are there any further questions on it? Required oh. by state law, they added the phrase required by state law. Does Mr. the green, so we have blue text and green text here in our copies. Does the green text just mean that text was moved relative to the prior draft in the last meeting? No, actually, those are the only, the, the changes I just mentioned are the only changes that were made okay. in this one. I'm like, where do you see green text, though, by the way, Mr. Bond? <laughs> I'm like, having a little trouble. It's, it's already gray. late. No, on the, yeah, okay. Oh, gray, okay. I agree. Okay. It's hard. I have a gray, green. Yes, okay. All right, so the only changes go well, the from ones the first reading to the to second meeting are those. And again, this is based on the feedback that I received from the committee. Mm -hmm. All right, are there any further questions? If not, let's uh, take a vote. All those in favor? And 6 0. Excellent. Um, at a, I know Mr. Bobbin had pointed out at a meeting at some point in the recent past that um, the committee does three things and policy, budget, and um, hiring and working closely with the super are those three things so the policy stuff is often like um, sticking toothpicks in your eyes um, it's probably even worse for Dr. Darty, but it's uh, critically important um, as it then guides the way for operational um, operational procedures in our schools so thank you all for reviewing them appreciate it now for one minute before I do anything else because I have Keep looking at Mara Drum, Drummy. Yeah. And I know we didn't do reports, so we never really got a report. chance to introduce Mara. So I just would like to oh, introduce Ram Mara as our one of our new student representatives. Um, and what year are you, Mara? I'm going in, oh, I'm, now I'm a junior. Great. So, yeah, I, can't, I still can't believe we started the year, but yeah, it's been going, it's been fun so far. Okay, great. Well, the first two days, the first two days were good at yeah. school. Should I get my report right now? Yes. Oh, okay. sure. Right. Go ahead. Let's no, do that. I, I don't know if I should go. I know. I'm a little right. out of water, but go right ahead. So looking back a couple weeks ago on August 22nd, we had freshman orientation, which um, a lot of juniors and seniors volunteered at, and they worked as what's known as freshman ambassadors. So they were given groups of freshmen, maybe 10, like a dozen or freshmen or so, and they were grouped by homerooms, so alphabetically. And throughout the day, they were able to go have Q and A's. So they would, there would be no adults with them, but individually with the older um, upperclassmen, ask them questions about their experiences. And then we give them a tour of the whole school. So they were able to see where their classes could be or where their locker would be, and just feel more comfortable navigating around because it can be really um, overwhelming at first. Then they also did team building activities. So at the end of the day, they worked in these same groups, their homerooms, 
um, playing a variety of games and doing some challenges where they definitely opened up and grew more comfortable with one another. There was an ice cream social, so mm -hmm. everyone seemed to really love that. Oh, they also met their guidance counselor. So overall, it was a really great day for them to feel more comfortable at the school. Then um, yesterday was community day. So instead of jumping right into our classes at the high school, we um, did a lot of the activities that you normally would have to do in the first week of school and you would miss class time for. So um, they did class meetings where you learn all the safety procedures and talking about you know the devices and you know, every all the new updates in schedules with the schools, because sometimes the schedules change. Then um, we did an activities fair where people were able to see clubs and meet the presidents of the club or the captains of sports and sign up for them. So this was a great introduction for the freshmen to find out ways to get involved with the school. There was a pep rally where they could also, um, you know, be surrounded with people from the whole school and just kind of bond. They also did more team building activities. We had the fire drill, so we got, we got that in. Um, they met their homeroom teachers, got their lock, oh, took pictures. So that was um, yesterday. And coming up, we're going to have um, auditions for our fall musical Mamma Mia. So that's going to be coming up this week. So be sure to see that. Mm -hmm. And then sports uh, games are going to be starting as soon as next week. So everything's kind of just the ball is growing and everyone's getting excited for a great, positive year. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marco. Thanks. Um, I think we'll go around and do the rest of the reports, and then we have our new business. So we'll start. Um, I'll, we'll keep going this way. I don't know if uh, Mr. Bobbin or Mrs. Vandenecker. I do. Um, so I'm the liaison to the select board. I just have a couple of points. They've had a busy summer relevant to schools. Um, the select board unanimously condemned the act of hate that was committed in June at Parker Middle School. And the select board announced that it intends to call together a meeting of stakeholders in the town to craft additional community-wide responses. Um, the Climate Advisory Committee gave a report at the select board meeting in June and expressed appreciation to the custodians and other staff of Parker Middle School for their very successful Earth Day Fair. They said the staff and custodians worked extremely hard to make that day successful. And they were also grateful for their, uh, the Blue Fit Friends and Family Day. The, um, that where they offered um, programs to our kids, uh, the Climate Advisory Committee. And last, the select board reorganized. Um, Andy Friedman was voted the chair. Barry Berman was voted the vice chair. Vanessa Alvarado was voted the secretary. And Chair Friedman and Vice Chair Berman are our liaisons to the school committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Van Mr. Robinson? Um, I don't think I have any report. I do. Two. Okay. So the RACASA update, as mentioned last meeting, our best wishes go to Erica McNamara, director of RACASA, who has accepted and already started a new position as program director for student mental health and wellness at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. They are very lucky to have her. We will miss her and appreciate all the vital work she has done since the inception of RACASA. Ms. Mac Ms. McNamara and Outreach Coordinator Julianne DeAngelis' award-winning work was reported at the last school committee meeting as part of the SAMHSA's National 2017 Recovery Month Award earned by RACASA. A representative was invited all expenses paid to Washington, D.C. in September because neither Ms. McNamara nor Ms. DeAngelis can attend. Our own school committee member, Sherry Vandenacker, has been invited to accept the award on RACASA's behalf. Dr. Vandenacker will also be the keynote speaker for the RACASA annual meeting on September 27th, so mark your calendars. The next RACASA meeting is, the next regular RACASA meeting is next Thursday, September 13th from 5.30 to 6.30 at the police station. Um, I also wanted to report that the Friends of Metco Pool Party happened despite torrential rains. <laughs> um, the rains, the last rains happened at 4 o'clock 
and we got a tent up over the food just in time. Um, the sky, sky's clear just in time um, for the party and the barbecue. About 100 folks gathered to enjoy swimming dinner in each other's company. Many thanks go to the elementary school PTOs and all of the families who contributed the food and lifeguard funding, to swim coach Lois Margeson for her wonderful lifeguarding, and to all of the staff and families who attended and made the event so fun. We had a lot of staff come, and that was really important. There were a lot of conversations and connections made. So stay tuned for more information about the Friends of Metco Chorus and other upcoming events. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Rowski. Oh, oh. Uh, Dr. Boxer. Sorry, it's okay. just really quickly, I was really honored to be able to attend, and maybe you're going to talk about this, the, um, the teacher initiation. You can if you'd like. <laughs> well, I'll just do a sentence and then you can fill in. Um, Mrs. Borowski did a wonderful um, message from the school committee to the teachers on their first day of school, and Dr. Doherty also gave a very compelling, tear-jerking, um, inspiring speech to the teachers, and it was really exciting, as usual, to be a part of that gathering of very motivated and inspiring teachers. Ms. Sprowski. Yeah, good. I was going to mention opening day, and you said it perfectly. Um, I thought that uh, Reading Teachers Association President uh, Eric Goldstein did a really lovely, a really lovely speech about teachers supporting each other and working together. Uh, and Dr. Doherty, I would agree, your speech was excellent, very moving, very inspiring. It was a really, it was a really exciting and fun day. So, um, I have two more. Yes. Um, the Special Education Parents Advisory Council is very excited to be kicking off a new year. Their first business meeting, I should say our, I'm still getting used to it, our first business meeting is Tuesday, September 11th at 7 p.m. right here at the high school library. And there's another important event coming up on Tuesday, September 18th at 7 p.m. also here at the library. Um, there's going to be a presentation on the Parker Bridge Program Review. So last year we brought in a consultant to look at the bridge program, specifically at the middle level at Parker. Um, and this is an opportunity for parents and concerned community members to learn more about what that consultant said and the uh, implications for the future. So that's a really important event. Um, I know that the CPAC would really like to have a special education meet and greet in October. So if we're able to get that happening, the date is to be determined, but I'll let everybody know. Um, and the most important thing I wanted to say about CPAC is all of this information and upcoming meeting dates are all available at the CPAC webpage. So you just go to the Writing Public Schools webpage, click on Department, Student Services, CPAC, and everything I just said and everything in the future is there. So that's really a good resource for people who want to join and become active in advocating for kids with special educational needs. We got one more. Okay. Okay. Um, you, I, get, I brought gifts to oh, yes. Everybody has a magnet that says save the date. Next May 31st through June 15th, 2019 will be when we as a community officially celebrate our 375th anniversary. This is a magnet you can put it right on your fridge so for the next year you can see that it's coming. Um, the Reading 375 committee will have a table at the Fall Street Fair Sunday, September 9th. It will be, hopefully, I believe, next to the RCTV, RCTV booth on the Common. And I really can't encourage everyone at this table and in the community to, to volunteer. We won't make anyone do anything they don't want to do, but um, it's a great way to just celebrate our community and celebrate our town and get engaged with some the people are just lovely who are working on this and we're doing some fun stuff. And even if you don't want to volunteer, just pop by and say thanks because they're great folks. Um, on October 6th, they're having an open mic night at the American Legion, which is right next to Christopher's on mm -hmm. Ash Street. And on November 9th at RCTV, they are doing a trivia night, which oh. is their third one. I've done it twice before. Yeah. It is a very fun, fun time. Time. So a lot of fun stuff coming up with Reading 375. Thank you. I just want to um, thank on uh, behalf of Mr. Robinson and myself, thank Ms. Borowski for our, um, speaking on behalf of the school. Committee. Sure, it was a pleasure. At the opening of schools. Um, Mrs. Wilson. I just want to kind of piggyback on the CPAC piece. Um, the September 18th meeting is an opportunity for, we will have a facilitator to assist us in reviewing the program review. And we're going to present an action plan to get feedback from the CPAC. And then on the 20th, we'll be presenting to the school committee. So that's an opportunity for more of a listening session. So I want to be clear, it's not really a presentation. Thank you. Um, it's a listening session because we, I think, as we talked about in the 
summer or at the end of the school year, we got the report late and we didn't have an opportunity for parents to really give us their impressions. Um, so we want to hear parent impressions and then we'll be presenting a draft of an action plan that evening for feedback and then revising and presenting that to the school committee on the 20th. Great, thank you. Uh, just quick um, opening week observation, 31st year in education. Uh, first year at, in the Reading Public Schools and proudly here. Um, just from the custodial staff to the principals to the teachers, I've just um, been so, so impressed with the level of care. The schools look terrific despite the heat um, and just so welcoming, very, very welcoming. Um, and I, again, I second um, the comments made about Dr. Darty's opening speech. Uh, I was very close to ugly crying, but <laughs> I resisted the urge. It was, it really reminded me why I went into this work, which I think is so inspiring as an educator who is not new to the field to remind ourselves of that. So thank you to everyone who got uh, yesterday off. I know uh, my son's last first day as a Reading Public um, School person, uh, last Kelly through and just my first and just yesterday was a very emotional day for me uh, being part of the team so thank you thank you i was fortunate enough to get a sneak peek so i didn't have to <laughs> <laughs> and i think my report was covered earlier yes <laughs> um, i'm going to do the updates, updates. are going to be my report okay, great so we'll um move into the new business on the agenda which is this summer updates um, PD, learning and teaching updates. There we go. So, uh, thank you. Um, so, traditionally what we do with this meeting is, is talk about what's happened this summer. You already heard all of the great facility work that's been done um, this summer. So, I'm going to get into the rest of the work that was done this summer. Um, first, I want to start with curriculum updates. We um, were able to purchase a significant amount of curriculum material um, throughout, the, throughout the summer. Um, and here, I want to first start with science. As you know, that science, um, through the, the support of the override, uh, there was uh, funding put aside for uh, curriculum work, curriculum updates, um, and science is the main focus. Uh, some of this we were able to purchase through uh, end of the year FY18 funds, some of it in the FY19. Um, what you see here is the, the science piece of it. I'm going to get into the other pieces in, in a minute. The bulk of the science purchases this summer focused on um, upper high school and lower elementary. So K to 2. Um, uh, science literacy curriculum read alouds. We also will be spending a little bit later in the year, we'll be spending a little bit more money on K to 2 materials in science. Um, grade 6, we have expanded to the STEM scopes that were in 7 and 8. Um, this, the 7th and 8th grade teachers love the STEM scopes curriculum piece so much that grade 6 teachers felt it was important for them to get it into their curriculum as well. Um, so that, that, is, that was also done. And you can see all of the high school uh, curriculum material that was purchased. Uh, several AP courses. Uh, we, you know, uh, updated old uh, curriculum material. Um, honest chemistry. Uh, th so these are courses that are taken traditionally in grades 10, 11, and 12. We also purchased um, a significant amount of equipment to go along with, with the uh, curriculum material that would be used in the labs, electronic balances, DNA discovery system, engineering equipment, um, biology equipment, and physics equipment. Um, so there's a significant amount of science materials and curriculum that were purchased this summer. Doc, Other Dr. areas Dr. where we purchased curriculum, yes. Just, uh, textbooks, is that all hardback textbooks? It's both. Or it's, uh, a, it's a classroom set yeah. of the hardcover and, and a <coughs> student set of the uh, digital. E digital, okay, yeah. thank you. In terms of other areas, uh, and we made significant purchases in elementary literacy. Every classroom library in grades K through 12 were updated with a complete set of classroom libraries, um, much needed. We were able to purchase Fountas and Pinnell Benchmark Kits, the latest edition 
for all classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, all classrooms in the district? Yep. Yeah. Wow. All classrooms in the elementary. Yeah. Yes, yeah. the elementary. Um, we were able to update all of our English language learner curriculum material for our English language learner students. Um, we were able to purchase readers workshop units of study for our teachers to be able to use the, the updated classroom libraries. So there's a connection there. And also we purchased several K-5 to math manipulatives to go along with the math standard work that we are doing um, at the elementary level. So uh, our elementary classrooms received a significant boost uh, of materials um, this summer for teaching and learning. In terms of professional development, curriculum development, um, here's a list of several things that happened this summer. Certainly at the top of the list is our new teacher induction program, um, which I mentioned earlier, which Chris developed and led. Um, so we had four days of training. Three of those days were at the district level. We had several uh, different people come in and present, uh, including Chris, Carolyn Wilson, myself. Uh, we, the town came and talked about benefits and things like that as well. Um, so there was, there was an awful lot of good information that uh, was presented to our teachers and it helped acculturate them to our school district and really talk about what is the Reading Public Schools all about. Um, as I reported out last year, we had we were part of several scene uh, communities that were uh, received the radar grant last year. As part of that, um, we are focusing on inclusive practices and universal design for learning. Uh, there are teachers that that are ambassadors uh, at Birch Meadow Coolidge Killam and RMHS that went through the training. There's be some additional. Teachers will be going through training um, in October. Uh, these teachers will be working with other teachers in those schools. Um, there will also be um, an inclusion specialist that has been hired by SEAM that will come in and work, I think a total of 20 days throughout the year uh, with the teachers in these four schools um, on inclusive practices. So this, what this does is um, it gives teachers a, a greater toolbox to work with students of all different uh, skills and abilities. Um, at the high school, there was a lot of work being done in science, social studies, and English. I should mention that, um, and I probably should have mentioned this before, that um, because we were able to do some purchasing with the FY18 funds, uh, it, it gave us the opportunity now to use some of the curriculum money uh, that was uh, that was approved as part of the override for social studies. Because now social studies uh, frameworks have been approved by the state. A year from now, the uh, eighth grade civics is now going to become a requirement. So our teachers are going to be working this year uh, on aligning the curriculum, not just in eighth grade, but it's really going to be grade grades K through 12, um, aligning our social studies curriculum to what we currently do now. It's going to mean some different topics going to be taught at different grades. Um, um, right now, civics is not a course in the eighth grade, so that means things that are being taught in the eighth grade are going to be realigned and shifted to other grades. Um, so that's going to require a lot of planning, curriculum development, and then eventually purchase of materials. So um, that is going to be happening throughout the district, but that work started a little bit at the high school this summer. And then the English department as well did some curriculum work and review of their core text. Joshua Eaton ran a responsive discipline book group with 12 staff members, and that ties into their core values in the PBIS work that they've been doing in social emotional learning the last few years. Killam also did some core values work um, and how it aligned to the social emotional learning that they've been doing. At the elementary level, um, our behavioral coach, um, Lauren Sabella, worked with elementary teachers and developed elementary social emotional learning standards that aligns with our open circle and other curriculum areas. So now we have that um, in place. The middle schools, they revised their, if you remember last year was the first year of the advisory program. So they took all the feedback from teachers and students from last year, revised the program, used the resources that are available to them, including um, Facing History and Ourselves um, and some other areas as well. They also developed social emotional learning standards that align with the advisory. 
And then the other piece that happened at the middle school this summer, um, if you remember in grade seven last year, we collapsed the levels. Now we're going to grade eight um, with that shift. So math teachers worked this summer on how to shift their curriculum and curriculum practices um, as now we go to two levels in, in math in the eighth grade. They also are taking a look at um, different program materials. Um, Engage New York Envision Math program um, and how that's going to be starting to pilot for next year and how that aligns. Some special education training and updates that happened and Carolyn if I'm misspeak mm -hmm. on any of this please let me know. Um, there was some training done through Landmark uh, for the bridge program at the high school, teaching algebra at the high school level, teaching reading comprehension at the high school level and visualizing verbalizing which was funded by REF. Um, happened as well. Uh, Joshua Eaton also did some work in uh, Bridge Program uh, with their teachers, uh, with some programs, Lively Letters, Wilson Reading Conference, Read Naturally, which was the entire special education staff, not just the Bridge Program staff, and they also did a significant amount of uh, summer planning. And then at the Learning Center at the high school, there was also a significant amount of curriculum work done with Learning Center teachers. At RISE, um, there was uh, work done by the teachers to plan curriculum and also do some specialized instruction for preschool students. Our extended year program had another successful year. We had uh, 293 students that were recommended, 202 students attended all or part of the ESY program. Uh, as you can see, we had a significant amount of, of staff that worked with those students. Overall, we had 68% of the students attend at least a portion of the program. Um, you met Allison Wright this evening, and um, she's already starting to plan for next year. She collected feedback from the staff and debriefed the summer already, and how can we improve this, this program for next year. She was the ESY coordinator um, as part of her new job responsibilities. Sorry about the small font. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and you've seen, we did a lot of hiring this summer. So I, I wanna break down, this is not a full quarterly report, but I wanted to just give you an understanding of um, the full quarter report will happen later on in the, in the year. So we hired 31 teachers. When you break that down, um, 16 of those teachers were vacancies due to resignation non-renewal. A significant amount of the resignations were relocations. I should add that that 16 is a very low number compared to previous years. Um, four for retirement, three were through restructuring of um, other positions or expenses. Um, we have some three uh, that are on leave of absences, and then five new positions which are the override funded positions. All of the teaching and administrative positions for the district have been hired, except for the ones that are listed there. We had a .4 Spanish teacher at the high school. Actually, we had the person hired, and they just recently resigned. Um, they're actually relocating. The .6 computer science teacher at the high school, a .5 crossroads teacher at Coolidge, and the 1.0 BCBA, which we are close to hiring, is my understanding. In terms of the override teacher positions, uh, just to break down I, the five at the, we've not really broken down for you what the five at the high school looked like. So 1.4 of those were for English, 0.2 was social studies, 0.8 was physical education, 1.0 was science, 1.0 was math, the 0.6 computer science, which still is not filled. We also had a retention of nine positions, two at the elementary and seven at the middle school. Um, so, pretty busy summer when it came to that, but the good news is, is that the, we did not have as much of a turnover as we've had in previous years. Um, so I want to want to emphasize that. Mr. Robinson. I just had a question. So, these, you, you said some of these positions aren't filled yet, so. They're just the, just the ones that are listed there. The point. The point for Spanish, the point for right. science. The 0.5 crossroads. Oh, I'm sorry. 1.0 BCBA. And they're repeated below, actually, in the override. Yes, yeah, some of them. Some of them are. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, the 0.6 computer science teacher is that was the was an override position. But it hasn't been filled. Right. So, can I just ask? Them, is there anything else in the district that isn't filled right now that critical that uh, that's not? There's a couple of paraeducator positions, but that's that's it. 
I mean, we're in really decent shape for hiring. Miss Doctor Doctor, what's happening with if there are missing teachers? How are the students being covered for those um, so coursework? We we do the best we can to combine classes if we have to, or bringing in long-term sub. Um, there are some retired teachers that would come in and maybe teach a couple of classes. The point six computer science. I know Ms. Boynton is is looking to see if she can restructure classes that exist already with staff that may be certified to teach some of the classes like one of those classes is an ap computer science class but we have someone else that is certified to teach ap computer science so there may be some shifting of classes and coursework um, the special education piece which is the crossroads um, i know that mrs Marchand is working with her staff um, to try to, you know, get its, you know, the coverage necessary to make this happen. I mean, when we're doing the best we can to make it work. It's going to be a struggle. Um, so we're using a combination of substitutes, um, things like that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Or not. Mm -hmm. We need to fill the positions. Yep. That's right. Oh, we know. Yes, we do. We're doing. Obviously, we're doing the best yeah. we can. Yeah. No, I. Just uh, unfortunately, you know, it's most of those are part-time positions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a pretty good economy right now. Part-time positions aren't necessarily an optimum <clears throat> right. position to fill. Particularly if it doesn't have benefits, which the point four and the point five do not. And oh, they're not benefit eligible. So the point five crossroads teacher at Coolidge, they're collaborating around the staff, so the needs, the IEP needs, are still yep. definitely being yep. addressed. Yep, we met today to talk about some plans and how we're going to do that. They have a substitute in there now, and we're, we're looking at how we're going to communicate to parents, similar to when we were without a speech and language pathologist mm -hmm. here at that school, following that same path. Thank you. Okay. Um, some additional, oh, so one of the things that uh, has ha that happened late last spring and it kind of spilled into the summer is we had an increase in the number of special education referrals for some of our programs, particularly the Crossroads program at Wood End and the TSP program at Killam, at Coolidge, sorry, at Coolidge. What this resulted in is that we, because of I, IEPs, we were required to hire additional teaching positions. So what we have done, we have contained this through the, the Special Education Cost Center. We have reduced expenses in some of the areas in special education to fund these 2.0 additional FTE. So what we've done right now is we've reduced professional development um, substitutes at, for the special education um, and some of the supplies and, supplies and um, supply lines mm -hmm. to get to get to the amount that we need. I think it was 125,000. I think, if I recall, some, I think it was like something like that. Um, so we're going to obviously monitor this closely, uh, but we have contained it right now within the special education cost center. And this was based on the fact that we did receive a higher number of referrals than normal at the end of the year, particularly um, at Wood End and in, in, um, in Coolidge. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like it came from one school; it was spread out among all the all schools. So you can't take a you can't take a teacher from one and Reality. move that because um, oh, um, yeah. unfortunately it doesn't doesn't work that way. Never, never we wish it would, but it doesn't. No. Um, as you've seen, all of the administrative and quarter coordinator positions have been hired. Um, the override administrative positions you met this evening, um, the, uh, the two curriculum coordinators, you met the assistant director slash team chair, uh, Allison Wright, um, and we did hire a technician as well. Um, and this, these were all positions that were part of the override that we were very transparent that these were positions that were going to be part of the uh, hiring process. Um, we also hired the school business assistant, which was part of the um, baseline budget from last year. Um, and just an update on the interim director, uh, the hiring process is in process, and we should, we should have an announcement fairly shortly about, um, about that person. Moving on to technology. 
This has also been a very busy area this summer. Um, we did not have the challenge this summer of, of updating Windows 10 for all of our computers, yeah. which made things a little bit easier. Um, but we have deployed 752 computers this summer, um, which is amazing. Uh, 504 computers uh, were replacement computers, and you can see the breakdown, 226 were staff, 278 were student, and then on top of that we added 248 new computers. Um, a lot of those were uh, out of the, the funding that was approved in the override um, for additional technology, and they were deployed through computer cards for science, uh, primarily, um, because as we said, uh, in the past, the, uh, the science curriculum is now interactive, it's digital, um, and so you need dedicated computers for those lab areas. So that's what the seven new computer cuts are. There were also some schools that did get new computer cuts that may have been funded through PTO or, or other funding as well. Um, so this isn't all operational budget, some of this is also PTO funding. Um, there's also been a significant amount of network work, network work being done in our schools. Um, and I don't know all of this technical uh, information. I tried to get a little bit today uh, from, from Julian uh, explaining it to me. Um, but, you know, we, we have upgraded our network significantly, which is going to improve uh, redundancy uh, in terms of if a system fails, that the whole system doesn't crash. Um, so we have also um, increased our bandwidth to all the schools for our wide area network, which is significant. Um, our storage system has now been upgraded as well. Uh, we upgraded our entire wireless. That project started last year and rolled into this year. And I do want to add that the facilities department played a major role in making this happen. Um, by being able to do the work in-house, it saved a significant amount of, of funds. Um, we're able to migrate our servers. Uh, from the virtualization, which we was an antiquated system that we had uh, for several years, into now, uh, which Julian called a Hyper-V high availability platform. Um, we've also done some work with our print services, um, which are going to really allow us to manage our, our print and copy system throughout the district, and it ultimately will reduce costs. Um, so the first, the first piece of that is going into place now, and you know, it's going to be uh, updated as the year goes on. Uh, we've also replaced our firewall um, and our security through antivirus, anti-malware, et cetera. So a significant amount of work was done. Some of this was operational, but a lot of it also was um, capital. Mm -hmm. and final, the final two were the capital that was approved as part of the FY. 19 budget that we did all of the we just placed all of those orders and did it based on all the specifications i do want to talk a little bit about school safety because we've also done a lot of work in school safety this summer um i believe i reported in a school committee meeting that we did have a joint active shooter exercise right after school ended in june with yeah. police fire in schools at killam um that was a really powerful experience and uh, really get, uh, got us thinking at some of the things that we need to do differently like you do any time with a drill. Uh, you go back thinking what can you do differently. We've revised, uh, and part of this is in the policy that you approved this evening. Uh, we revised our emergency operations manual for all the schools. Uh, we are going to spend the year going through that uh, with a district-wide safety committee uh, to make sure that it really is where we want it to be, and certainly we'll have police and fire involved with that. In August, we participated in tabletop exercises on safety situations, um, and we had administrators and directors there. It wasn't just principals. We had the director of facilities there. We had our um, after um, extended day coordinator there. We, uh, our MECO director was there, uh, as well as building principals, assistant principals, team chairs. So. Um, because obviously we all need to be on the same page when it comes to responding to an emergency situation. We have a new safety calendar, we have a new reporting format when drills are done um, and how that's gonna work. We have, uh, as you know, a new SRO is hired, so now we have two in the district. Um, 
Matthew Vatcher, and he'll be stationed at Parker. Uh, Brian Lewis will be stationed here at the high school. Uh, they will be working together the first couple of months as uh, Officer Vatcher learns um, you know, the, the, the roles and responsibilities of NSRO, but um, eventually there will be um, assignments to different schools. Most likely it will be based by geography, but that is certainly up to the chief um, to decide. There's some upcoming events coming up uh, that are related to school safety that we're going to be involved with. Uh, the State National Fire Protection Agency is offering an active shooter symposium. It's at various dates, but the one that uh, several of us will be attending is at Stonehill College on September 20th. So police school facilities will be attending that. We also have staff, uh, both police and school, uh, well, mostly police, will be attending at Westfield State a symposium and one in Quincy. So I think Reading's sending a pretty good contingency to these symposiums um, over the next month. Middlesex Partnership for Youth uh, is having a safety summit here at the high school on September 24th. We'll have about 200 uh, participants. Most of them will be uh, uh, safety, uh, uh, police, fire, uh, but there will be school as well. Uh, we're planning on having uh, the majority of our administrators uh, attend this. And as I mentioned earlier, the District Safety Committee is going to convene to review emergency safety operations plans uh, throughout the year. Uh, just some other things that are kind of connected. Uh, I do want to echo what uh, Mara said and what Chris said and, and Carolyn about the first two days of school. and. Um, you know, the, the heat was obviously uh, a factor, but the first two days of school were amazing. We all had the opportunity to get into the buildings this week, um, either the first two days when teachers were here or the two days with students, and we're, we're able to uh, just see all the great things that were going on. The high school was a completely different schedule, as Mara talked about, but saw the kids engaged, saw the kids you know, really invested in, in having a great, great school year. Um, some very, very good news is that the United States Department of Education Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Service Visit will be here on September 14th. Um, we did receive word, or actually it was Kelly Boswick received word, and I want to make sure I, I capture this correctly. Um, from information. So the visit will include Assistant Secretary Johnny Collette and Deputy Assistant Secretary Kim Ritchie. In addition, Russell Johnson, who's the Associate Commissioner from our Massachusetts Department of Education, and is going to be joining them. The focus of the visit is on rethinking special education. So they're coming. Um, they were at, it was actually recommended that they come and visit Reading um, in the types of programs that we offer in Reading. Um, but they want to get our input on what special education should look like in the future. Um, they're going to also take a look at some of the work that we're doing in Reading to support students with disabilities. They're going to do on some site visits. We're going to be scheduling visits to Birch Meadow, RISE, and RMHS. So they're only here in four hours, um, so we, we can't have them go everywhere, but those are the, um, we're keeping them in this, you know, this uh, campus area. Um, so, and we're going to have teachers, district coaches, and administrators, um, as well as our collaborative um, executive directors attending as well. So we're very excited about um, this opportunity to, to uh, give our input on what special education should look like, and certainly it's with the United States Department of Education. Dr. Dr. Uh, just a quick question. Will parents also be included in that? I'm going to defer to Mrs. Uh, Wilson's been putting the yes, schedule together. We, we have a, um, a listening session that we will be um, looking to have CPAC representation. In. So it's a very short window that we have yep. them here. And so they have really asked to see our programs because they have heard about the wonderful things that our teachers are doing. And so I want to, the focus to be on seeing teachers classrooms and, and practices and instructional um, work that we're doing with students. Um, and we are providing some opportunities to meet, but really the focus, focus is on, on showcasing teachers. what our teachers are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, parent University, uh, we are going to be scheduling Parent University. Remember, we had Parent University last year um, in October. We are scheduling Parent University this year in the spring. Um, we, are, we are trying to work around the schedule of a speaker that we really want to bring in. Um, we have secured funding for this through Reading Cooperative Bank and the Reading Education Foundation. Both are major sponsors for Parent University and, and you actually approved the donation tonight from Reading mm -hmm. Cooperative Bank. Um, so that's why we're, we're shifting it to the spring so that uh, we can try to get this speaker, and I can't remember the person's name now, <laughs> I, I don't want to announce it till it's yeah. official. That's yeah. right. We don't want to announce it until it's okay. official. But it's someone. <laughs> but we're, it's somebody big. It's someone somebody big. big. <laughs> it's someone big. It's a great point. And we're really yeah. excited about it. Yes. Great. Um, the Pride Survey, uh, I want to just give you an update in the Pride Survey. Our goal is to have a presentation at the next meeting on September 20th. Uh, we were slowed down a little bit because we had to we had to complete one last piece of the survey, which is to have the high school students complete the survey, which actually happened this week. So now that we have all of the different stakeholders who were able to participate, participate in the survey, um, we will now be able to um, generate the results through Pride and have a, hopefully have a presentation ready for you on the 20th. That's the, the current plan. And um, Chris, Chris and uh, the curriculum coordinators have been working on curriculum guides. Um, they are close to being completed, and it, in the near future, those will be uh, posted on our website. What we'll be doing is posting them on the website with a link to some feedback um, from the community, from the staff. We've, um, we'll be showing them to principals. We're just about done with the drafts. Uh, so. They should be coming perhaps by the next school committee meeting. We will already have them up and be looking for responses at K to 6, and we're starting um, other subjects and other grades. Excellent. Wow. <laughs> can, can I ask, this has nothing to do with this, but this is more of a technical thing. Did you actually vote on the consent agenda after you voted on? They voted on the consent agenda um, without the uh, the August 8th and then we voted um, on the amended we did we voted on the consent agenda without the August 8th I don't I don't think you ever voted on the rest of the I consent don't think agenda. we voted oh, on okay because it started that we were removing an item and no just we voted on okay. it oh it's a friendly we, and then we and then we voted okay. on the uh, are you Jean saying brought up that we didn't Vote on her. Oh, we vote. My, my memory is we did vote on the consent okay. agenda. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. We just wanted to make sure it was five to zero because yeah, we, uh, okay. Sherry right. wasn't here. Yes. Okay. And also That's fine. the amendment. Why, what brought that up? <laughs> the amendment. Was we were just trying to get clarification. That's all. Yeah. The, there were both five zero votes, right, okay. on the consent agenda, and then on the voted, August eighth. Um, actually, I voted for the consent agenda. I didn't oh, okay. Vote for the minute, the, okay. Right, because I was. We voted the on it. Okay. Perfect. Okay. We just wanted to double check and make sure. Right. Nick, uh, follow up question to the terminology here, maybe for Miss Kelly. Are these the pacing guides? So we're calling them curriculum guides. Those are the things that we're going to be publishing. They're based on the state frameworks. They are very specific, and they look different depending on the subject. So for instance, math has essential questions by category, by the key areas of mathematical instructional best practice. Um, what you're talking about pacing, those are teacher tools that we're going to continue to work on. Those are not ready at this point. That's not but the so curriculum we, guides will be ready very soon. Great. And so that when we have the discussion about the district improvement plan and all the items of action items, one of them is the pacing guide. This is not that. This is yeah. not that. But we are, this is going to be done in concert with that. Good. But a first step is to get these up and running. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Is that it? I, I, I think this is Mr. Bob. Right, I, I'll do Jeopardy for curriculum oh. updates for 200. There you go. Next question. Okay. Just two questions about curriculum updates. Um, Fontes Canal Benchmark Kids, third edition. So this is great because when we had the yeah. discussion mm -hmm. with uh, about Joshua Eaton, there was 
at one point in that discussion, I remember someone bringing up there were different letter guides and ranges for students. Right? So yeah. Quantus Pinnell is a reading assessment that's yeah. done by teachers in classrooms with students individually, right? And there's there's a range by letter, and the grade ranges are a range of letters. Mm -hmm. letters right? So you're assessed a letter. Um, and, and I guess there was a difference in how that scale was done in second and third edition, but we, we've resolved that now. It's the same scoring. So everyone scale will be trained. The, the Josh Wheaton um, team had been using the third edition. We have kits for all of the schools, and we're actually training everyone district wide. Okay. The third edition isn't just a recalibration of those letters, there's also a much more comprehensive comprehension section. So it's going to give us more data mm -hmm. um, on the children. Our new humanities director is fully trained in the third edition. She's mm -hmm. been using it in her previous district, oh, and she'll be training our reading specialists and other literacy folks in the district. And then on the first uh, release day in October, we'll be training everyone. Will okay. we uh, assess 100% of our elementary school students this year in FMP? That'll be the plan. We have an assessment calendar already up and running that principals are disseminating, and that includes uh, the dates that we expect to have those assessments in place. I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah. Last question. Math. So this is a great idea, just going back to the very beginning of this presentation from Dr. Darty. The um, math and science curriculum, and maybe, I'm sorry, maybe it's just science. We've had a series of discussions as a committee over the past couple of years about needing additional funds for science curriculum. There were three buckets, right, 150K each. Is this the end, like with the override money now and what we're investing in curriculum, are we, at, have, are we fully, do we have all the resources we need to complete the implementation of the science curriculum across all levels, or, or is there still a piece out there that's not funded beyond what you're showing here? So one of the things I mentioned earlier is at K-2, to we still have a few more purchases to do, but we'll be doing it this yeah. year. And that's within the budget? That yes. We have yes. So we have everything that we need the in the district to be. Uh, other than maintaining what we have, yes. And, and the and professional no development end. to go along with it. And the professional development of to course. go along with it. No, so we're, we're fully funded on science and we have yep. a roadmap to yes. complete the implementation. Yes. Terrific, thanks. Uh, Dr. Starr, I just have one question. Um, I, I don't, you, you may not be able to comment on this, but with regard to the interim special education director, um, just the, uh, the budget, or do you see that we'll be um, fairly neutral on that? So budget impact at this point, I, I don't want to comment yet because we're still in the process of hiring. Okay. We'll be able to report out on that once we have everything okay. earned out on it. Thank you. Any other, uh, Dr. Doxer? Um, a combination comment and question. Um, when, when I was writing for the school notes column of the Chronicle, I continually was astounded by what happened during the summer, and I think this summer you have even surpassed mm -hmm. what I had written about before. I just am so impressed with how much you have accomplished. Um, in terms of the curriculum, in terms of purchases, in terms of the hiring, the creative, the creativity, solving the last minute increase in special ed needs within the budget that we had. Um, I just thank you very much for that work. Um, not a relaxing summer for you guys, I suspect. My, my only, I appreciate that comment, but my only comment to that, it, it takes a team effort to get all these things done. And I didn't mean, I um, meant, my, sorry. And no, no, so I, I want to emphasize that, that when, when everyone is rowing in the same direction, things happen very well. And, you know, the closing of the fiscal year is a perfect example of this. I mean, we had, between the building principals and central office administrators and um, Gail leading that that whole piece of closing out the fiscal year. There was a lot of good things happening, a lot of materials that were getting purchased and we we were organized, we were it, we, it was prioritized and it we, you know it really it really worked out well and it just showed when you work together the types of things that can happen. So um, it was a true team effort. True team effort. The, the second part of my question slash comment was I was impressed by how many teachers also were here during the yeah. summer working together to get ready and improve what they could offer this year 
And my question that's attached to that is so when teachers come in during the summer to do that kind of work, pardon my ignorance, but are they compensated for that work? It depends on what, if they're attending a class or doing curriculum work, it depends on what activities are occurring. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll just go quickly back to um, public input before we go into executive session. There was yeah, public input. Really short. Not, yep. Okay. So, someone asked me to ask this, and I was stumped. I couldn't, I, I didn't, I don't know what to, how to, I'll just ask it, because I hope it's something that never comes up. In the high school manual you guys approved last week, in the new chemical health policy, there's fines. Like first offense is one day suspension or fine, pay, or payment of a fine. Second offense, payment of a $75 fine. Third offense, payment of a 75. So the question is, where's the fine going? So the fine is actually town. That's the town. It doesn't have to go into a revolving account? No, the, the, the fines are a, a town. So the town deputizes our assistant principals and principal to be able to uh, administer the fines, but the fines are paid. That's a. It's like when you pay a pay parking ticket. Or town or credit it would go yeah. through the town. Okay. And it's actually a town ordinance. Okay, and if a student for tobacco, right? Yeah. And and if a student can't afford it or a family can't afford it, is it waived or? It, it's not a. It's it's a town ordinance. So it's a town ordinance for tobacco that um, is paid. Directly yeah, this, to yeah, this isn't a user fee or something like that. Right. This, no, I just this could, is an actual fine I, for. Violating. Yeah. No, I was thinking like when you lose a book, there's a lost book revolving account or a library revolving it. Like money goes into that. So. But this is not this tied isn't to the school. This is school revolving account. And is this going to be on, only at the high school? Do you see this getting filtered down to middle school? I mean, I'm all for punish, all, punishing the offense. Okay, that was just this person's question. Thanks. Thank you. I think we covered everything unless I missed something and I think we got all parts of our agenda. We have a need a motion to go into executive session. Um, to Boxer. protect the bargaining position of the board, move to enter executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining, the approval of minutes and not to return to open session. Is there a second? Yeah. Second. Roll call vote, Mr. Bobbin? Yes. Mrs. Van Den Acker. Yes. Mr. Robinson. Yes. Ms. Webb. Elaine. Yes. Yes. Van Den Acker. Yes. Okay. So that's a 6-0 vote. We'll